Okay, so welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. Uh, I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan, and tonight I have a exciting and fun guest, Andy, with us. Thank you for joining, Andy. Wonderful. Thank you for having me, John. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, you and I uh, <clears throat> met in a pretty uh, interesting way. <clears throat> um we met uh, in Sedona, right, Arizona, in uh, in March, and uh, it was very cha uh, challenging in a unique way for me just to get there, you know. So I'm just so glad I I did because meeting you has helped me as an author and uh, you know created this new energy flow in my life. And uh, so we're going to get into that and as we learn about you. Awesome. Yeah, that was an amazing event. It was, uh, I don't know if you remember, but it, the, the weather was a little extreme. There was a lot of wind. And, uh, the, and so it was, there was a lot of energy and some really, you know, wonderful people. So uh, I, I, me too. I was really thrilled that we got to connect there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we'll get into that. I, I imagine Sedona might come up a little bit more. Um, so uh, to start with, uh, I'd just like to ask you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Is there anything you'd like to share? Just sort of general information, like where you grew up and where you live now. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, yeah, I, so I'm currently living in downtown Los Angeles. People think I'm crazy <laughs> that I live here, but it's a very creative center. And so uh, I enjoy it very much. Uh, I've kind of lived in lots of different places. I was born in Canada. But uh, I was uh, born and raised at a time when uh, corporate uh, America was very much about uh, moving people around, moving them with their families that, you know, didn't quite have all the Internet that we have available now. So uh, we spent a lot of time moving to places all over the United States. And I remember in my second grade year, we literally moved six times. <laughs> so nice. I've wow. lived in a lot of different places. But uh, I would say my home is probably here in Southern California. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. And came, you started in Canada. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I was born in Canada. My, um, my, my extended family is Canadian, both parents. Um, but uh, with the corporate job, uh, my dad was transferred to Ohio, I think, initially. And uh, then just kind of stayed in the United States from then on. And I became, eventually became an American citizen. Uh, funny story there. The reason I became an American citizen is so that I could be in the Miss America pageant. <laughs> wow. That may not be, you know, <laughs> a lot of other people's reasons for becoming a citizen, but at the time, that seemed like a, a really important thing to do. So wow. <laughs> we all have our journey. <laughs> so, so you were you were born Canadian citizen, I imagine. Yes. Wow. And did your parents change citizenship too, out of curiosity? Actually, my father did because of his work. So he, when I needed to get my citizenship so to be in the Miss America pageants, he, you know, helped me and he got his citizenship at the same time. Wow, cool. Yeah, because I, I imagine not everyone in your family would be trying to get into the Miss America pageant. So I didn't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, that's cool. That's, that's very, yeah, that's very unique. Fun. It's a unique part of your story. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, so we're going to talk about your life journey shortly. Um, before mm -hmm. we do that, I'd like you to just explain to our listening audience what is Sacred Dragon Publishing, as that's, you know, the title of the show and kind of what it, you know, what we're wrapping everything around. Thank you. Yeah. So Sacred Dragon Publishing um, is a hybrid publishing company, which means that uh, we provide services to uh, individuals who are interested in self-publishing, as well as uh, people who might be interested in a publishing imprint. In other words, you know, like more of a traditional publishing agreement. Uh, what our goal is and what, kind of the platform is for helping authors to uh, bring in high vibration, uh, what I call messages of the new age, messages of the new earth. 
so that we're anchoring in some very high vibrational energy for, uh, for the readers and just for the market in general. Um, I have a passion around this idea of, um, you know, what we can do as creatives to be very conscious about the, you know, with the work that we're putting, far, uh, putting forth, which is very much in line, I think, with some of your beliefs about being very conscious about our creative creativity. And so um, I like to work with authors on a very whole person level, getting to know them and getting to uh, getting to the real messages that they have to bring. So that's kind of just a, a short snippet of, of, of uh, our kind of mission, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I definitely I would. I would view that as a mission, you know, and I remember when when you were describing Sacred Dragon publishing to me in Sedona, when I asked you about it, you did mention that, uh, you know, part of your vision is to help take some of the burden off of the creative people, uh, right. being that when you do it all by yourself, there is a whole lot to think of. And if you could be uh, a partner in, in alleviating some of that burden and making the book stronger, that would allow more people to get their work out into the world. And I thought that was just a really uh, sort of mature and uh, thoughtful in a way to, uh, to approach what you do. Thank you. Yeah. It's very important to me that I, that, that I try and help my authors stay in their creative zone because there's so much, as you well know, as uh, you've done a lot of uh, work yourself, um, and you have several published books, there, there's a lot of uh, task side to it, kind of what I, you might call the left brain side of, you know, mm -hmm. getting a book out. And that can kind of tend to take away from the fun and creativity and flow of, you know, the message that you really want to send out. And then there's also just the collaboration that maybe can help, you know, kick it up a notch and make it a little bit more fun and maybe a little bit more appealing and really get your message out maybe in a little bit more compelling way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I know just having a sounding board, someone that I could speak to about my book who uh, actually actually cares, you know, it's not that the people I would normally speak to don't care, but they can only care in as much time as they have between our interactions from, you know, to have someone who's focusing on caring about it, mm -hmm. genuinely does care, just it's huge, huge, makes a world of a difference, really, you know. Um, right, like connecting on that personal level, connecting on the vision level, um, so, so that the, you know, that's the other piece that I feel very strongly about, too, is that when the book is produced or the, you know, the words of the book are produced, I believe they carry an energetic imprint with them. And so I want to, you know, make sure that the author is very empowered about that imprint and that we do our best to make that as high vibe and expressive uh, of the artist's view as possible. Yeah, right. I also remember you said that each book has its own like uh, vibration, right? And if it's a lighter vibration book, when you bring something from the ether into the physical, it grounds some of that physical or that that higher energy into something physical, making our physical realm a bit lighter, perhaps. So. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I, I do, I really do believe that, that, you know, especially creatives, art, artists, authors have this, you know, wonderful creativity coming in, but um, for these messages, the books, songs that, that are of a maybe higher vibrational level, it takes a lot to bring them in and anchor them. And so that's also part of the partnership that, that maybe isn't particularly quantifiable, <laughs> right. but there, there is this um, kind of teamwork that's needed, I believe on somewhat of an energetic level to bring that, you know, that whole energetic piece into our uh, 3D expression into form and uh, so, so that it can be accessible and shared. And so that that's part of the partnering that I do is to, you know, help make that clear channel so the works can come in. Yeah, wow, fascinating. And um, we'll, we'll find out a little more how you got to the point in your life where you figured out that that would be something you were cut out to do from this point on, you know, because that wasn't always what you've done, right? So, <laughs> all right, so let me uh, ask you um, another question and just like to say, Hello to everyone watching and thank you for watching and um, whether you're catching it live or on the replay, uh, we appreciate it and feel free to leave a comment either now or later. And uh, um, yeah, thank you for being here.
So, so Andy, your life trajectory is super fascinating. Really, I, I mean, get, just getting to know you through working on the book has been just a joy. But learning about your life, it's 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 more than a joy. It's actually pretty fascinating. So, um, your life, you went from professional fashion model at a young age to the U.S. Army, to a major in the U.S. Army, to a legal career, career in public service, from Buddhist practice to a black belt in martial arts. <laughs> Now you're leading a very inspiring life in the field of empowering authors uh, and creators to uh, self-publish or, or traditionally publish and get their messages out into the world. So can we start by talking about your fashion model experience? This, this I really want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of a funny story. Um, so when I was younger, uh, about 12, 13, I uh, was very much into sports. And this was at a time when, um, I'm not trying to date myself, but obviously I'm a little older. And so anyways, this was at a time when there really weren't, at least where I lived, uh, girl sports. So if you had some talent, then um, the only option was to play on the boys teams. And so um, I was particularly good, kind of, well, I was kind of good at tennis. And so I tried out for the boys team and I made the boys team. And uh, we went to the, you, take, you have to get a physical, you know, have to be cleared to play on the team. So we went to the doctor's office to get the, um, to get the physical. And the doctor came up to me and slapped me on the back of my shoulder, on, the, on my back and said, so what is it this year, Andy, football or basketball? <laughs> and my mom went through the roof because we had this ongoing <laughs> drama between us of uh, that I wasn't very good at uh, doing the girl things. So she was quite uh, discouraged by all that and um, basically said that you can play on you can play on the boys tennis team if you go to charm school at the same time. <laughs> oh. there, I don't even know if that's a thing anymore, but <laughs> basically it's a place where you uh, you know kind of fix yourself up a little bit and learn a little bit about you know, uh, modeling and things like this. So anyway, so we went to the charm school and she actually paid me, she bribed me, she paid me $25 a week to go to charm school. So we uh, get there and I did the, the classes for a couple weeks and the director decided that uh, she thought I might have potential in modeling. And so they cleaned me up and within a month or so I started getting bookings and I was a, a that was a very kind of lucrative part of my young life for many years. Wow. And, and I, it was one of those things where I was uh, kind of one of those kids that really didn't get to go to high school very much because I had this whole other career thing going on. And uh, so there was, that was, it was kind of interesting to kind of live in, adult, in an adult world and, and live with, with these, um, you know, expectations around professionalism and, you know, working and all that at a young age. So that's kind of why um, I think it, it was really significant in my life in, in you know, kind of setting that tone of um, living in the adult world and you know, being professional and, and the, the whole world of modeling is, is a fascinating industry to talk about. Um, it's, yes, it's about how you, know, you're, how you look, but it's, it's, it's a business like anything else. So there's um, a lot more to it than just showing up with the face. Wow. Yeah, wow, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, so what did you feel, so around maybe, what, age 14, you kind of started a modeling career, or that was like? Yes, I, when, it, when I was able to, um, you know, when I started doing more than just kind of local work and started traveling and that, yeah, I was about 14 by then. <laughs> wow. Um, and uh, did you, I just had a curiosity, did you have like a short haircut like you do now, or was it a different look? They, it, it, you can have whatever what they want. They'll use wigs or whatever, you know. Oh, but, wow. but yeah. So my hair was 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 it was this was it was not like this. That's for sure. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Definitely interesting. I remember. I remember, That's funny. You should ask. I remember one time, uh, I one of my ad campaigns was was Supergirl. So there was a, a store, um, kind of like uh, Macy's or a big department store, and they had. And my thing was, I was the Supergirl for that particular ad campaign. And I don't know if you remember, but stack perms. But I had this really funny stack perm was part oh, of my wow. Supergirl look. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? 
That's awesome. When, if you, if and when you put out books about your own life, I'd like to see some of those photos in there. <laughs> they're all they're all hidden away under my mm -hmm. bed. And I right. imagine at some point in my life they'll they'll come out and see the light of day again. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fun. I mean, how could I have how could I have guessed that you were a model? I mean, I, you know, why not? Why why wouldn't you be a model? But I, you know, I wouldn't have just wouldn't have guessed no, it. You know, it, it's 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 definitely unusual <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and, and for and at a young age like that too to be like i said you know kind of put in that adult world of business and fashion is a very competitive industry so it's really um you know interesting to to kind of see all of that um at such a young age and it really kind of informed me you know moving forward um about uh, you know kind of taking responsibility and just just being uh professional and you know getting that worth that ethic worked out at a very young age mm -hmm. yeah i'm sure there's benefits in there did you feel like yes i wanted to do modeling or did, was there a sadness about giving up high school in a way or you were kind of for it you preferred to go this other route yeah high school wasn't a fantastic experience for me so i wasn't over you know i and and of course you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of kind of glamour and stuff about the business. So I didn't have any problem with missing out on high school, really. That wasn't particularly a concern, though. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, so it, it, it reminds me of just stories I've heard about childhood actors. You know, it, it's the closest I've, I haven't really heard about childhood model stories. So, but I imagine there's quite a bit of crossover in terms of, like you said, it's a business, it's competitive and maybe grueling schedule from time to time. I don't know, people telling you what to do, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that would, like, if I were to say, uh, you know, one thing about it was that uh, you, you're not, you, you know, you're not yourself. Like, like you asked me if I, if I kind of like enjoyed it. Well, I, I did in the sense that I wasn't particularly crazy about high school. So having something other to do in the high school was, was fine. But the industry itself and, um, and the experience, you know, I, and I don't, particularly know for sure about acting but it's probably somewhat similar i mean you show up for a job or a gig and it you just are there for whatever they want like you don't you don't really feel a sense of yourself in the whole process so you know where an actor takes on a role modeling is very much the same you know maybe you don't have a speaking part but you certainly are portraying an image and you're just you know made up right. <laughs> you're putting some kind of costume and you know, you have to come through with this image or message that they want. So it, it was kind of interesting at that stage in my life to be, you know, kind of disconnected from my sense of self-expression. Wow. And did, did you still manage to have a social life of like peers your own age? Or did you feel like ostracized because of your role as a model? Yeah, I mean, I was my, my social life to the extent that there was one was was very much my modeling crew. So mm -hmm. I really didn't have have much of a connection with uh, like peers, particularly. You know. Right. I mean, I would, I would guess so. You know, it would be hard to to maintain that, you know, or establish it. Yeah. Wow. Cool. I mean, I, I, we could make the whole show about modeling, but I, I know that would it be is. It's, a, it's a fascinating industry, <laughs> but yeah, I don't want to go. I don't want to spend more time mm -hmm. on it either, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you've definitely piqued my curiosity about it um, and about your experience there. So, you know, if I if I bring a question in about it again later, uh, please you sure. and me. Uh, so let's see. So we began there. So then you've shared with me uh, in some of the material that you've shared about your life that you had experience in the military and that you also have had to deal with what's known as Gulf War Syndrome. Uh, can you speak to that? How how has that influenced your life? Um, what led you to the military? I'm, I'm curious. And then uh, that Gulf War syndrome, how did that affect you and where you are today? Yeah. So um, after as the model after um, modeling, like by the time by you're like 18 or 19, uh, you're not very marketable in a lot of uh, modeling. This the kind that I was doing. So I needed to you know, do something else. So I went into business and I had my own businesses for a while. And then um, as I kind of transitioned out of that, I, um, well, even while I was in business, I should say, I was very uh, drawn to the military and there's no history in my family 
of anybody being in the military. It was very curious what that was, but I, but I was very much drawn to it. I was living in San Diego at the time, which is close to Camp Pendleton, which is a huge Marine base, right? So um, I still to this day don't really quite understand what that almost compulsion was to uh, go into the military. Um, but I do think, and now, now kind of like reflecting in, in, in big picture, and if I might just offer a, a suggestion that I do think that um, part of our life journey can be that uh, we connect with maybe past or concurrent lives if you're somebody that's open to the concept that there may be other aspects of ourselves besides just this experience. So I do think that there's a degree to which, and I certainly would say that perhaps is what came through for the publishing as well, where um, I've connected with other aspects of myself, either past or concurrent lives that, that kind of came through and you know, were a significant part of my journey in this particular expression. So the military just became very significant to me. I uh, went through ROTC and was, um, I got a direct army commission, which is kind of unusual. In other words, if you go through ROTC, usually you get a reserve army commission and you serve in the army reserves. But um, whatever reason, I was uh, just did a lot and was fairly successful. And so I got what's called a regular army commission, like the kind that you get if you come out of West Point or something like this. So I was immediately put into active service on graduation and um, served as air defense artillery officer, which was really interesting. Um, it's one of the few branches where uh, women are in combat arms. So it was fascinating to see, you know, to get that training and, and uh, be, you know, in the military from a combat perspective as a female. Um, so anyways, that eventually led me to Germany. And when I was in Germany, I, um, uh, we were going on exercises a lot. We were getting a lot of field duty. And the mission, the uh, Patriot missile, system, missile program, at least at the time in Germany, um, was controlled by NATO. So I was working unbelievable hours and constantly out in the cold hills of Germany with the, you know, in my little shack, you know, with the missile sites and everything. It, it was not something that was sustainable. <laughs> So I uh, looked for other employment within the military in Germany, and I was really fortunate. I got picked up as a protocol officer for a three-star general, and um, he liked my work, and I eventually became his aide. And so um, uh, in that capacity, uh, we went to um, we were, went to Gulf, to the to Desert Storm. I got deployed in Desert Storm. And uh, so I was served in Desert Storm. And um, during that experience, I mean, that's a whole other fascinating, crazy experience being in a war. Of course, many would say that Gulf War was not like, you know, some other wars, but it's still, there was still combat and, and it was very um, ex challenging experience. But uh, certainly during that time, I was exposed to a lot of different environmental uh, toxins. And so uh, I came back and started law school. <laughs> All these transitions, there's lots more in between them, but we're just stick with that. So I came back okay. uh, and it got off and back to duty, a whole story there. Anyway, so I'm in law school wow. now and about um, a year and a half into law school, just got very, very sick. And th the doctors couldn't figure out what it was, blah, blah, blah. Um, so eventually what happened was, um, I had to, uh, I, I was literally dying. I mean, I was like 95 pounds. My skin was almost gray. If you would have seen me, you would have thought I was a cancer patient on my way out. Um, so uh, we did, the doctors really didn't, they, they, they did figure out that I had one thing called Q fever. And so they did treat me for that, but I was in and out of the hospital quite a bit. Anyways, ultimately uh, I ended up just taking my, my parents got me a place in the desert in Borrego Springs. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for about six months. And I got a dog who, and so me and my dog, you know, kind of healed myself. And I just did a lot of meditation. I did a lot of um, alternate uh, therapeutic, therapeutic uh, treatments like Ayurvedic, 
um, different things. And um, I don't know, it just, it might, I had some interesting experiences um, and just I made, I managed to turn, turn myself around. But it, it's a little bit of a miracle. I don't quite know how to explain it. I um, mean, people that saw me, you know, come back from the desert, like, you know, six, eight months later, they were like shocked. They couldn't believe that I had come around like that. Wow. Yeah, it definitely sounds like you were given a second lease on life or, or a new life yeah. almost, right? Yeah, it was it was something that I still to this day can't quite explain. But, um, you know, basically, I knew I was going to the desert to either die or live. <laughs> 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 I pretty much wanted to live. <laughs> right. Like, so you, maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. But uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we got past that challenge somehow. Right. So you had your own private desert storm in a way when you got back, right? <laughs> that's an interesting way to say it. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That, that's really awesome. I, I guess, and I know the desert's very harsh and the desert's, uh, but also super beautiful and, and it's potentially silent depending where you are. And uh, probably like, you know, the, the story of Jesus goes to the desert to kind of uh, be clear, clear on his mission and it comes up in, in many other folklores or, or, you know, religious stories and stuff. So you really took it, took it to the whole, whole new level <laughs> and uh, did it. Yeah. I mean, the, the key was to get away from uh, the um, chaos and noise. So, so kind of like what you were pointing to the serenity and the solitude. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, it, you know, but by the time, I left, I, I, you know, kind of checked out, shall we say, I had three jobs and I was in law school. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, part of what was happening with me was my, my body was just, I, I just wasn't up for all that. <laughs> so I knew that part of what needed to happen was I just, you know, needed to check out and just be really still and quiet and let the noise of the world go away. And so that my body could repair. Um, at least that that's, you know, kind of where I was, was coming from and suggesting to my parents, this, this plan of, well, let's see what happens if I just kind of like cave out in the desert for a while, <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. I mean, to me, it, it makes perfect sense. I imagine to some people it doesn't, but yeah, I, I'm glad you did that. You know, you found your center again. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so I also understand you, you have a background as a Buddhist practitioner of the new Kadampa tradition, if I'm saying that right. So I'm curious to know, when did that enter your life? Um, how's that journey been? And also, maybe before you get to it, maybe it kind of leads into it. What were you? What kind of meditation were you practicing in the desert? Because I imagine you're still pretty young. And I wonder what tradition you had or what books you were reading to know how to meditate unless you grew up with that, I don't know. Yeah, I did not. Uh, my family wasn't particularly religious in any sense or particularly spiritual. Um, so, uh, at, it, it, you know, going back to the Borrego Springs, heal yourself time, I really didn't have a particular uh, tradition or philosophy that I was following. It was pretty much just more in the vein of self-help type meditation. So I wasn't even aware at that time of the kind of the concept of connecting with like a higher power or, um, you know, other, you know, it's it, it like on an energetic level, I, I wasn't even aware of that. So it was, it was just really basic, like breathing kind of, you know, in the self-help vein type meditation. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, the Buddhism came into my life uh, when I was uh, practicing as a lawyer. And um, I was a criminal prosecutor and I was really challenged by, by what I was doing. I, was, I wasn't really feeling that I was, that was my calling. And I was really challenged by being somebody enforcing laws and putting people in jail and this kind of thing. It just was a challenging concept for me. And so that inspired me to um, look for something more, look, you know, look, look for the answers, look for something deeper, get to know myself on a, on a more spiritual level. And so I started reading uh, books, uh, I think it was Thurman, Robert Thurman, I think was the first author who I was really interested in. And he has a lot of books on Buddhism. And 
so yeah, so I just started reading. I started, I was probably reading Buddhist philosophy for a couple of years before I got the nerve to go to an actual Buddhist center <laughs> and, right. you know, talk to people. <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. And it was really funny. And on my way to work, I passed this Buddhist center, which was a Kadampa center. And it was probably about six months that I drove by that place almost every day before mm -hmm. I got the nerve to call and go in and, you know, ask about it and inquire. But it's really funny because um, the gal that answered the phone, the first thing I said, do I have to wear anything special to go there? I mean, that's how silly the whole thing was to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my silly view of it, I should say. So anyways, she said, no, no, you just come. So I, I, I think I went that evening actually. And um, it was really profound. When I mm -hmm. walked in the door, and then went into the, the room where there's the shrine and the Buddha uh, sitting there. I almost, you know, fell down. I mean, I, I was just completely overwhelmed, tears rolling down my face. It was, it was a really profound moment. So I, I, you know, again, you know, connecting with some part of myself that had a, you know, very significant relationship with the Buddhist faith. And mm -hmm. so from there, you know, it just, it just blossomed and I got very, very involved with the whole community. And eventually I was an administrative director for uh, one of their larger centers in San Diego. And um, that was also an, an amazing experience to be able to participate and help um, the, you know, something that I really found a lot of benefit in life from help expand that and help share it with others. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, it sounds like you did find, uh, at least at that time, like a second home for you or, or mm -hmm. like a missing part of yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, my story is a bit similar. I, I won't go into too much detail, but I, I was seeking for a couple of years and then, um, I was born Catholic and I, I liked going to church on some level, but then I drifted away from Catholicism and, and then sought very various different faiths. I went to a Jewish meeting. I went to uh, uh, I went to India, you know, and looked, checked out Hinduism and, and I, I did a lot of seeking. And um, it wasn't until I went to this Buddhist meeting uh, after I'd broken up with a girl that I was with for three and a half years. And I'd already experienced Buddhism, this particular Buddhism that I practice. But I just wasn't ready for it at the time. So it was a year later, I'd broken up with my girlfriend and I was more myself in a way. And I was also suffering, right? And uh, I went to this meeting and at the end of it, they invited the guests up to chant into the Gohans in this mandala to lead the chanting, which is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And I rang the bell and I chanted to this big mandala in front of my face with everyone behind me chanting with me. And I just felt like I was back in my grandmother's living room. I was mm -hmm. like, just, I just wanted to start crying. I'm like, this is the safe home feeling that I haven't had in a long time. And, right. and that kind of just made me realize it was, I think it was a week after I broke up and I walked out of that place and I was happy and I was smiling. I'm like, am I allowed to be this happy a week after I broke up with my girl? Like, this isn't right. Like I can't even, I was so happy. I wanted to call someone and tell them, but I like nobody's going to understand me why why I feel this way you know so that you know that began a long journey and I think a month after that I received my gohonzon which is what you do when you become a member and that was uh, May 2009 and I I would say I have not skipped a day of chanting since then that's how natural it was to me you know uh, where I, I had tried meditation and, and all various things. I, they're beautiful. It's beautiful. I just, it doesn't come natural to me the way that chanting does. It's hard for me to meditate, you know, mm -hmm. hard for many people, I imagine. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever it is, I'm a doer, I'm a coffee drinker. So like chanting was something, it was an active, doing, right. you know, yeah. it, it was hard for me to, to like drink a cup of coffee and then sit and do nothing or try to, <laughs> right. you know, and I wasn't going to give up the coffee. So you know, whatever. So it, it that, that worked for me, but I can relate. I can imagine how joyful I, cause I know the feeling in a way when you walk into that center, that Kadampa center for you, that was the right fit at that moment. And 
and you felt at home, I guess, right? It, absolutely. And it, it was just interesting you're saying about the, uh, you know, the meditation and the, the different parts of the, the practice and how um, the, the chanting, well, of course, you're a musician, so that would probably really resonate for you. But there, there, that was a piece for me, too, because when I, even though I had some meditation practice from when I, you know, did my time, in, uh, my kind of healing time in the desert, it was, um, you know, not particularly structured. And so I, I also, and I think that's pretty common for people to, to be a little bit challenged by that, that part of the practice initially. Yeah. But I had the same reaction as you, the chanting just lit me up like no tomorrow. And, and there's all these, and you know, the, the Sanskrit language or whatever language that, mm -hmm. uh, the, the chants are in, you know, ju just automatically, like it's, it's, it just comes, it just came through me. And it, it mm -hmm. was, you know, and that was the, it, it's funny because all about the music, right? That was the part that really got me connected. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it kind of went from there and, and there's, and like you just said, there's a particular chant prayer that I say before every meal, every day. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple other chants that I say throughout the day and, or, or chant throughout the day. So yeah, it's, if that's, I'm not really connected with that, that organization anymore. And my uh, spiritual, uh, you know, kind of been on a spiritual expansion. So I don't do a lot of the Buddhist practices anymore, but the chanting stuck. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I could, I could see that. Um, there was something I wanted to share. Oh yeah. The, the, regarding the musical thing. So yeah, the musical aspect of chanting definitely uh, got me. Uh, and where I also, cause I, I came from a Catholic tradition, which is very uh, reserved. You know, and when Catholics sing in church, they don't want anyone else to see them. It's a, it's a huge, uh, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm making a stereotype, but my experience was when I went to church, I was singing and like nobody wanted to know, to let other people know that they were singing too. The, the people who did were the weird ones, right? So I was one of the weird ones. I want to sing because that's an expression. And uh, so I felt like it was, a, you know, for me, uh, Catholicism felt not putting it down. One of my upcoming guests is, is an active Catholic. I think he, I don't, he's not a priest, but you know, he's engaged in the community. You know, I still have very uh, warm feelings. I, I visit churches because the Holy, when I was in Japan, I visited temples everywhere. When I'm here, I visit churches because I like those holy spaces. Yes, definitely. You know? I hear you. And, and they're accessible, right? Uh, other yeah. holy spaces may not be accessible to the public. So, um, but anyway, yeah. So when I started chanting, you know, praying in Catholicism was quiet. You say words that I didn't really necessarily make, didn't make sense to me so much, but chanting in different language, because we chant in, uh, uh, in a different language. Uh, I, <laughs> is it, is it Sanskrit or, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I really should know, <laughs> but, um, anyway, we're chanting in a different language and, um, the rhythm because we chant sutras like these whole sutra passages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean right. they're, they're like booklets of yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I I've studied this profusely, but you know some of the words are, I know that Nam Myoho Renge Kyo itself is a mix between Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Sanskrit, mm -hmm. and, which is at that time it was in the 1200s when this was uh, announced to you know was shared with the world, and at that time that was universal, right? China, Japan, India, you were covering like the whole world in the 1200s. So it was seen as a universal declaration and you can't translate it and chant it, it doesn't work. It's those particular sounds in that yeah, combination. Exactly, yeah. You know, and it has, I mean, you can translate the meaning to understand it, but not to chant it. And it's six syllables. So it's very nice because it, it rolls. Nam myo ho renge kyo, nam myo ho renge kyo. And you could chant quietly, you could chant under your breath, you could chant slow, you could chant fast, you could chant loud, like roaring lions uh, chanting. It's it's all fair game, how, how you want to express yourself with the appropriate, you know, event. So uh, it that it's energized. When I went to a church, I was not able to do that, like to let out this like roar. And it's very much in this Buddhist organization, SGI, the women are very much empowered to, to be leaders, just like the men, you know, there's none of this male oriented thing, right. it, it really doesn't like it, you know, of course, 
it's part of reality and history, but uh, there our main uh, sensei always talks about making sure we listen closely to women's voices and never be disrespectful and, and to incorporate young people as well, you know, mm -hmm. and people of color and uh, sexual preference. It's all, all welcome. So it, it felt really good being at a meeting, seeing all these different people from different backgrounds. Right. So anyway, I went on a tangent, but I just kind of got inspired by the, what we were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the, uh, I was just going to say too, with the, uh, with the chanting, uh, I had the kind of the same experience in, you know, initially going in there and people like some people are just really getting into it. And like, you know, like the person beside me, they're like going to town on this <laughs> chanting. And then I'm, I'm, you know, it was a little bit kind of like, wow, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. And so after like, I kind of would sit in the back a little bit to kind of like be, you know, because the people that were particularly exp expressive seemed to like to be in the front. <laughs> So, but then after a while, you know, I just realized that that was kind of like my own limitation and, and I was, you know, holding myself back from, from getting into that feeling of just, you know, being free and, and, and just really feeling into the, the power of the, the, the chant and the, the energy that it was. And so, you know, before long, I'm up in the front going for it too. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's cool. That, that also, actually, that reminds me a little bit of um, going to as I was seeking on the way towards Buddhism, I went to, uh, I, I don't know, it was some form of Christian church. I, I'm not sure if it was a born again Baptist church. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it was like one of those storefront churches. I went to the second floor. My friend dropped me off there because I told someone I was going to check this place out. I was the only, uh, you know, I was the only person of my ethnicity there, which I think is fair to say because, you know, I stuck out like a sore thumb but nobody gave me any weird look at all. They just totally welcomed me, was glad I was there. And then they started really getting into their service. <laughs> like this was like almost like a rock concert, you know, like they were really like starting to get impassioned and, you know, you feel in the spirit, are you feeling the spirit? And then there was a drum set up there and people playing, but there was no drummer that night. And I would first time there, but I just felt like people were just so into the spirit, no one was going to care. So I would just crawled up to the front sat behind the drumstick drum set grabbed the, <laughs> the sticks and started playing like i was playing in a thrash heavy thrash metal band i was just playing my heart out and the guys around me were looking at me like yeah and i just like <laughs> smashed away and playing adding to the music and it was this euphoric sort of yeah. uh, bliss whatever the, the word is um ecstasy of the spirit i never went back there uh, you know, I say good night. Uh, nobody, it's almost like nobody saw me come or go, but mm -hmm. I was just part of it. And uh, actually, there, there was one student I ran, a young boy who was one of my students later on in, in a, as a sub. And he said, Why don't you come back to church? You know, he, he was like the son of <laughs> he went encore. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Amazing experience, you know, in, yeah. in, in life. It is. Yeah. I, the, the, uh, and, and, and you know as you your music is life right right behind you it, it's it is that common thread i was just talking to someone about that earlier today that you know while language has all its you know the the, the diversity and but the, there's there's something about music and even even if we talk about uh, some of the the sci-fi movies about you know connecting with uh, you know beings of of another world we connect through sound right sound and vibration so uh, yeah i think i think that is, is is very profound and why it is so much a part of spirituality and you know religion as well right and, and i would i would say like a lot the closest thing i've had some of the experiences i had in church when i was younger then then later as a buddhist and then in those kind of more exploratory times music was so important especially if it was like really powerful music and then the closest thing to that was going to rock concerts, especially if it was my favorite band. I know the words and other fans know the words and we're in unison sing together. It's, you know, even though my, 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 the message of my book is, you know, some music is, could be potentially toxic. There's a large gray area. And if the main, if the, if you're getting more good out of the experience than bad, you know, it's, it's important to kind of see the whole picture. And I think a lot of young people or older people too, 
need that outlet to scream or to just like be in a crowd and to feel united as one singing a song that's meaningful, you know? Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm of your, your persuasion as well. You know, the, the music in and itself, although some, some stuff like you share in your book is, 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 you know, just kind of downright toxic probably, but for the most part, I think it's how we engage with it. And that that's where the conscious part comes in. Right. So mm -hmm. even, even like you're saying, if it's a gray area, but it lifts you up and your, your relationship with it and your way of bringing it in and sharing it is, you know, is this something that's uplifting or at least, you know, a little bit higher vibrational. It, it, it it's it, it's what you make of it like like so much <laughs> of life right mm -hmm. but but i think it particularly comes through you know there in in, in because I, I like all kinds of music and one of the things i love is just pop music and and because i don't particularly listen to the words full disclosure sometimes but but i get a feeling from it and so while somebody else might be like, wow, I can't believe you listen to that crap. You know what? Thank you for your, that, that you feel that way. But for me, the way I'm interacting with it, it's lifting me up and I'm having a ball and I'm bouncing along and I'm doing a little jiggle, you know, jam here and there. So, you know, I, I think it really is just the, the question of the conscious interaction with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like bringing that consciousness to it for sure. So, um, I'd like to get a little bit into your experience, uh, legal career and a public mm -hmm. service. You spoke about it. Just what was it like to spend? And I don't, I don't even have to say how many years, but I take it. It was, it was a few. Uh, so what was that like to, cause at every stage of your journey, I'm sure you can look back and like, think, Oh, wow. I was a model at one point. This is totally different. Or I was in Germany doing, doing these, uh, this field work and I, I was, uh, in the desert, not knowing if I was going to live or die. So you always, each each step, you had more perspective. So at the time, by the time you're actually, or, or thinking that you're a business owner, you know, by the time you're actively doing legal work, what was that experience like? You know, what was your day day? What was your life condition like? Maybe. Yeah. Well, so I was so um, from I was a, a lawyer for over twenty years. It's just amazing how time flies. And for most of that time, I, wa I was a criminal prosecutor. And um, primarily I did fraud type cases, so complex frauds for the state of California, the uh, attorney general's office. And um, like I said, uh, there was a time when I had a real challenge about that role um, because uh, I think there's, um, there's a lot of trauma in our culture around persecution. And persecution and prosecution, they, they, they kind of sound alike. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly been times in our history when that line has been very blurred and it you know, became persecution. Mm -hmm. So I had to find, you know, look inside and find out, you know, why am I doing this? Because I feel like my, my path, I felt fairly guided in my path, just like kind of ending up here in publishing. So I feel like I've been guided. So before I you know, made a decision that, wow, this isn't, isn't right for me. I really want to explore. Why am I doing this? Why am I here? Um, what is, what is my service? So what came to me as um, I was, you know, getting more involved in Buddhism and learning about karma, what I realized my, what I was doing in the way that I practiced as a criminal prosecutor uh, which is very different from what you might think of for like, uh, uh, you know, the TV shows with the district attorneys and, you know, it wasn't fraud prosecutions isn't is, is kind of different from that. A and B, I wasn't in a district attorney's office. So the kind of um, cases that we took on uh, were cases that uh, were kind of selected for a particular to, for a particular reason, because the the. Um, of its of the of kind of like a greater impact on the public. So a lot of my cases had to do with you know scams and people being defrauded. And so we wanted to get the message out that you know we see what you're doing out there. This kind of thing won't be tolerated. And here's here's how we're going to work that. Um, so anyway, so what I where I came to peace within myself was realizing that the way that I was a criminal prosecutor is kind of allowing the parties 
the criminal and the victims to balance their karma with each other and in themselves. So I wasn't, I wasn't looking at like how big of a, you know, prison term are we going to get out of this? And, you know, of course that, 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 that's the technicalities of the job, but at a higher level, it was really holding these, you know, very uh, two ends of the spectrum and energetically working with the situation to kind of harmonize and clear and bring some balance to their lives so that, that this part of them coming together could kind of be resolved and free them from that to move on. So when I was able to kind of move into that way of dealing with my work at an energetic level, and in the way that I interacted with defense counsel, the defendants, the victims, all of that court, it, I, I really felt empowered and I felt very um, you know, good about the work that I was doing. And so then I, I, I you know, stayed on and did it for a few more years. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, that, that's really great. Um, you, I can imagine if I was, uh, I, mean, I can only imagine, but if I was being prosecuted against, I would really hope that the person doing it would have some degree of compassion for me, not, not to let me off the hook, but to at least not like dig in any more than necessary, you know, just to, to, to do what's appropriate for my life, you know, to somehow see that. And, and, you know, of course, maybe someone in a criminal position may not be able to think that way or, or only subconsciously or you know, unconsciously think that way. You'd be surprised. I mean, I was, like I said, I wasn't, I was very fortunate not to be in a traditional prosecuting agency, like a district attorney, where there's not really room for, you know, this kind of like, oh, maybe a little bit different approach. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I was very direct uh, with counsel and um, oftentimes with counsel present, of course, I would speak directly to the defendant and, you know, get to that point of what, what is right, what is right here, what is just here. We have this person that's been harmed, you were involved in the harm. Tell me your story, how, how do we make this right for everybody? Because I, I, it was really important to me that I was not, you know, showing up and, and this is, this is just me. And I'm, there's a prosecutor out there listening. You know, I, I'm not trying to say anything or disparage how other people are prosecutors. I, this was just my particular experience. And I was feel very fortunate that I was able to do this, but in any event, so I, I looked at both the victim and the defendant as people and really how do we work together to make this right? And you'd be surprised, I was surprised, I shouldn't say you would be surprised, I was surprised at how often the, the, the defendant really did kind of want to make things right and let this go and be done with this part of their life. And that's why I would say, you know, on an energetic level, I'm working with them to clear that so they don't have to drag this around if you believe in, you know, more, we, we have other lives that they're not dragging this around for the rest of this life and you know ongoing life so let, let's work together to get this all cleaned up if we can and I, I would say really in 20 years there was maybe not even half a dozen defendants who just weren't really reachable and those cases quite frankly were not fraud cases those were cases involving much more uh well not necessarily more egregious but but physical acts like either sexual crimes or abuse and assault type crimes and that, that that's kind of like a different level <laughs> perhaps of misalignment with your soul that mm. I, I didn't really know how to um, navigate very well with them so that's mostly where that came in but but the the, the, the scammers and the fraudsters for the most part they they wanted to put it behind them Mm hmm. Wow. Oh, man, that, that, that's, that's interesting. So in, in the Buddhist philosophy that I study, um, which is a, this school is Nichiren Buddhism, that that's the type of comes from this priest Nichiren Daishonin, the 1200s, of course, rooted before that from Shakyamuni, uh, 
mm -hmm. you know, historical Buddha. Uh, but anyway, uh, basically, in this, the philosophy I study, it's Buddhism encompasses everything, including all the religions and, and including, of course, the world of law, including the world of war, you know, so nobody's excluded. It's that profound and all encompassing the whole universe. Nami Renge Kyo is the mystic law of the universe. That is as how we, we, we learn it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's open to everyone. So, of course, it's open to people that practice in, in whatever fields. It's open to the criminals. You know, it's open to people who've done heinous things as well, uh, because human beings are human beings. And how can we, why, why uh, not allowing people to learn the truth about themselves and, and, and the, the, how the law of the universe works wouldn't do us any anyone else a service. So it's important for everyone to be learn how it works. Anyway, I got off on tangent a little bit. The point was that, um, yeah, I mean, of course, being a cop, being a, a soldier, being a, a prosecutor, all of them can be approached as a Buddhist or from a very compassionate, humane framework, because we do live in a system that where those roles exist. Perhaps one day we'll, you know, we can elevate into a different systems where those wouldn't, people would just not do those things. <laughs> so you would need mm -hmm. to guard against it or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know. I just thought I want to share that uh, perspective. Yeah, very much. I mean, I, I think very much that we're all one. Mm, right. So when you cast out or condemn another, there's a part of you that you're that that is in that condemnation. And so I, you know, very I, I very much believe we're all one. And so that, you know, was, was part of you know why I, I felt so um impact, you know, passionate about always looking at the criminal as as very as very much of a person as the victim and as much of a person as me and as much of a person as the judge you know so uh yeah because like i just you know i very much believe we're all one and condemning one over the other is is just it's it, it's foolhardy you're not seeing the big picture <laughs> but wow. that's not to say and and so why you know like why prosecution was important as a, as a you know part of my journey though too is that there there does have there, there is value in you know looking at those challenges and resolving them because left unchecked you know they can cause quite a lot of harm and so part of the buddhist path too right is to not to cause harm mm -hmm. so if if you if you let that go and unchecked then it continues to allow harm to to be done so that was the other piece is you know coming in to um kind of stop the suffering not not stop stuff but alleviate some of the suffering uh you know try to check up the harm and you know just like you said kind of look at it and from the bigger picture of helping society at large and it's kind of the same thing i felt about being in the army it's it's kind of funny um one of the reasons when i you know signed up shall we say was that I really had at that time, and I'm not sure I feel the same way now, but at that time, I really felt that my calling was to bring peace through strength. That uh, by being, you know, the, 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 the strong country with the, you know, democratic ideals and all that, by having that role, we could keep peace through strength. Naive, but that was the intention. And pure, pure-hearted, right? At, at that time, I, I can sense that. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, it, the SGI, this Buddhist organization I'm part of, we have a brand, you know, we have many members in the military, you know, they're mm -hmm. usually have meetings at a military. So it's recognizing that, yes, this is the world that has military. So if we can empower more, if more military personnel are empowered to learn about a life and, uh, you know, a life enhancing or uh, life respecting philosophy. And, and, you know, with which gives people more power that you're, you're, you're these here to defend our, 
our human rights. You're here to uh, protect and use your wisdom uh, to care, to help balance these, you know, um, international forces somehow in a compassionate way. I don't know how you do it as a military personnel, but I'm sure there's slightly different techniques than for a non-military. Uh, you know, if you're embodying a Buddhist philosophy and still having to carry a gun and stuff, I'm sure it's a different. Uh, I, I imagine I would have to think a little bit differently because I'm petrified to carry a gun, you know, but uh, I understand that's the world we're in. Um, so exactly. I mean, we all there's all these, you know, we have the world we're in. So, you know, because my my the, the, the organization I was with, we did a lot of outreach with the military too, and went to the military bases and that kind of thing as well. And um, it was never to say you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. It was to say that you as you know, a human being, you know, a conscious human being embodying compassion, embodying, you know, the, this higher view and way of living and being can, can hold that in your heart and in your person, but still perform your function like me. I could still be a prosecutor, which wouldn't necessarily seem like it's an alignment with Buddhist philosophy, but it was how I held it in my heart. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the service, a lot of the service members that uh, we talked to, they were just so thankful because it's, it's, it's not, it's not particularly natural for people to have a gun and be told to go kill. I know when I was in, in the desert, in desert storm, one of the things that was just kind of mind blowing for me was, as I said, I was a general's aide at the time. So I would go to these meetings about, you know, strategy and where we're going to bomb and, you know, all these things we're going to do. And then, you know, like, sure enough, you know, 1700, boom, you know, the, the, and how many, and then I'd go back the next day and, you know, how many people we killed. Wow. That was, that was really effective. I mean, that, that was, that, that's not, we're, we're not really made that way. You know, the, the military makes us think we think that way. And there's, I think a huge brainwashing that goes along with it. But that's not really who we are as humans. <laughs> yeah. We're love. And mm -hmm. so, you know, helping this, the soldiers or Marines, and mostly it was Marines, to connect with that part of themselves and, and still be okay with what they're doing was, a really, was really helpful to them because mm -hmm. it's a struggle. You know, we're not, I, mean, I don't think most people are, are um, naturally inclined to pick up a weapon and kill someone. <laughs> No. <laughs> and, and, and even though you put it on the, you know, you put on the mask as well, I'm doing it because I've been ordered to do it. And this one, it, it, there's still a psychological and emotional, you know, energetic disconnect with that. So I think there was, you know, I think it was helpful, that outreach. Yeah, actually, I, I'm thinking now, um, I had a, a close, someone who's a, uh, let's say a friend of mine, in a Buddhist friend of mine who was in the military and uh, what, was the, what was the one after Desert Storm? Was there? Uh, he, he, he was younger. Um, in the the one after 9/11, whatever that war effort was called, uh, he was there, and um, he had a chance to. He prides himself in being a tough guy, and he had a chance to shoot someone. It was just in some whatever. It, it was an opportunity, and and he didn't do it. He, he probably feels like he couldn't do it. Uh, he was, he was chanting, you know, his mother was really encouraging him on the phone to chant when he was feeling down and, and, uh, he's pretty sure it was his Buddhist practice that stopped his finger. You know, if he wasn't so awake and aware of the preciousness of life, he probably would have done it. Um, but it also bothered him that he, he felt like he wasn't like brave enough to do it, which is kind of a ironic, right? And even though he was, elite a Buddhist leader in his own right. Um, I guess he felt like he should have had more courage, but for me, I feel like he did the, by far the, the, the more compassionate and you could say courageous act, like to, to not shoot when you're in the military it might look like you're not courageous. So it takes courage to be that guy that doesn't do it. Maybe, you know, I don't know. To stand out is like the one that's saying, you know what, I can't do it or whatever. But yeah, and 
he had PTSD and, you know, uh, when he got home, traffic scared him and all that stuff and not fun. No. Yep. Um, yeah, that the, the, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's a very big difference between, um, you know, being in kind of like a, a being in battle, shall we say, and you're, you're in the throes of battle and you're protecting your, your people. And, and I, that, that's a tip, particular type of mindset, but then this, this kind of, I don't know what situation he was in, but it was more like a, a one-on-one or a little bit more isolated. I think, I think that would be really, really challenging. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, yeah. it, there, there's, there's, there's that kind of heat of the battle thing and you, and your, 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 your survival <laughs> and your survival of your, you know, friends and, and the people that you're with, that, 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 that kind of instinct comes out a bit more, but I would think, you know, where it wasn't quite at that, that same level, that that would be very challenging. And I, I really admire that he did the right thing for himself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure his conscience could, it was a lot more ease that he didn't do it, even if his pride mm -hmm. was, you know, hurt or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, yeah, it was, from what I gathered, it was like a much more intimate thing. And uh, yeah, I could imagine being in the heat of a, a bigger battle, like you would only take a really partial blame, right? Because, you know, because you, you don't know who you're Well, you're just, you're just, you're geared up at a different level, I think is what I'm pointing to. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're, uh, your adrenaline and and just the the, the it, you're at a different level you're, you're not really in a, a place where you have much opportunity for reflection at all right. you know what i'm saying so so there's a, there's an instinctual more of an instinctual piece that comes into play there yeah mm -hmm. but where it's not where you're not in that in the throes of that and you have a little bit of space however small it may be for a little bit of reflection and hey wait a minute do I really want to do this? Then, I, you know, that, that's where, where um, yeah, the gray area, <laughs> as you like to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, hey, but that, that PTSD thing is really, you know, I, I do think that part of when I, you know, part of my desert storm, uh, Gulf War syndrome kind of thing. Um, and that, 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 that's an actual thing. I mean, I, I know people have a lot of, that there's some controversy about it, but, um, there are people like myself that are officially registered as having that affliction. And um, they're, they're, I just share that because I know there's some controversy around that. But um, the PTS thing is very real. No matter, I, I think, no matter if you actually, you know, kill somebody and you're in some intense battle or it's just that you were in a war. Because again, it's just not, we're just not, or if you're, let me put it this way, if you're a sensitive person, and I would say most of us are more than we understand and that we are mostly of a loving nature as a species. It's just, it's just, it, it's, it's kind of unfathomable to be thrown in a war type situation. And so anybody coming back from that situation is gonna go through PTSD on some level. And of course, you know, it, it, it varies in the extremes for me. I, I came back and I started drinking in a way that I hadn't drunk, been drinking before. So that, that was, I was kind of like doing the self-medication, self-medication thing. But then I started law school within weeks. And um, of course you can't, that doesn't, that doesn't work. So I, I, was, I was very fortunate because I could see how there was a self-medication kind of downward spiral, spiral that I would, could have easily fallen into um and isolation i mean one of the one of the first things that happened when i got back was i could not handle all the people and all that that it was so i got i kind of isolated so you know that that was a very down could have been a very much of a downward spiral but thankfully i had law school so i was like you know had something to focus on right away but i, I very much feel for people that didn't have something to latch on to like that mm -hmm. Because things just don't make sense and there's pain. Hmm. It yeah. hurts, you know. And so there's it's really easy to look for, you know, ways to to self-medicate and work work that out. Yeah. And I, so for me, the bigger picture is uh, you know, to eliminate I, that sounds like the wrong word, but 
uh, basically it's the word uh, eliminate the machinery that that justifies war you know to, to to put young people in a position where they have to come back from war or where they can be sort of confused enough for lack of a better word i don't mean that offensively to think that war might be a, the right thing to do at some point right to think well i guess like we might have to go kill some people you know not not to make any judgment calls on on uh, soldiers you know but uh, that we allow machinery, for lack of a better word, to to justify war, that we get yeah. some acceptance. Yeah, I mean, so I, I have two responses to that. One is that um, I don't really don't believe that most people that sign up for the military get that they're going to be killing people. As I mean, it, you, you kind of get it on some level, but mostly the military presents itself as offering opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it's offer, offering opportunity to get out of that small town. It's mm -hmm. offering opportunity to get that technical skill that's going to get you this job. It's giving you an opportunity to get money to go to school. Right. So, so that like on a very real level, the, the military is very good at making this, this package sound amazing and, and how it's going to you know, change your life in, in positive ways. And so that, that gets gets going and and i don't think that a lot of people that go in really get that you're going and, and uh, that you're going to be going to war and quite frankly you know except for the last several years there, there really was uh, you know decades of mm -hmm. people joining the service and never seeing you know battle so the, right. the, the the chances that you and, and even today the chances that you going in are going to be in a battle situation are still pretty limited i mean the, like for instance when i came back from what, one of the things i was doing while i was in law school one of my three jobs was um i did go i did uh resign my active duty commission and went into the reserves and i was a logistician so you know, there, there's a whole there's a whole career as a logistician in the military that has nothing to do with being on a battlefield. And yeah. in fact, the, the combat arms part of the military is very narrow. So mm -hmm. but so that's one response. And then the other response is that um, that's why I'm so passionate about Sacred Dragon Publishing and my authors, because how are we going to overcome that machinery? How are we going to move our world into a place where we do not have wars and our kids aren't put through that experience? It's going to be, in my personal opinion, at least in part, by raising consciousness. Exactly what you're doing, what, 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 why I'm so passionate about Sacred Dragon Publishing, because we anchor in that higher vibrational energy, that higher consciousness, that as it collectively grows, those kinds of old systems just don't exist they don't have meaning because there's not that kind of conflict people aren't aren't living in fear and separation and these things that create the divides that lead us to war mm -hmm. yeah 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 beautiful uh, very well said I, I do really feel that with consciousness rising we can you know i, I do part of one, one of my beliefs and this is not this is not a Buddhist thing. This is something I've absorbed from all the different information I've taken in because I'm, I'm a seeker and uh, it was seeking that led me to Buddhism, right? So I can't allow my seeking to stop if it's naturally, if it naturally occurs. So I be, keep seeking and seeking. And uh, I do on some level believe there are separations happening on planet earth and that, uh, you know, you've, you've, we've, Many of us who are in certain circles have heard 5D, 3D split, that some of us will kind of enter five dimension reality and some will stay in three dimension. But I, I do want to basically believe that that's happening all the time and that there are many alternative earths that you can live on. And I think the one I'm living on and the one it seems that you're living on, because like we're in a shared reality, certainly at least, at least at this moment, uh, is one that prefers 5D or, or even beyond 5D, you know, multiple multi-dimensional loving uh reality of con conscious beings that recognize that we are one so it doesn't mean that that becomes boring or corny <laughs> it just means that life can be a much more um amazing experience of collaboration of trust of faith of loving expression 
you know, without having to think about what's in it for me, because what's in it for you is just implied that because you are you, meaning I are part of the whole. So when the whole benefits, I benefit. So do you. So we just contribute to the whole. And maybe on some level it sounds communist, communist or something, but it's not because it, it's uh, if the people that are running it, meaning if us conscious beings are fully standing in our autonomy and we don't want uh, what's unnatural and unhealthy for us, then it doesn't have to go there. You know, we could just stay conscious and healthy and keep co-creating and collaborating and without worrying about uh, taking the credit too much, you know, or without worrying about the financial rewards, if we trust that we're each here to take care of each other. So, you know, we don't have to worry about the basic needs. I don't know how we're going to get there, but I feel that we're on that path. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think that, um, you know, my personal belief is that we are kind of in leaps and bounds becoming aware of our true power as human beings and our ability to create our, our world and create our, our reality. Um, I, 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 I very much believe that what we think and what we, our intention and where we put our attention and intention is what actually creates our reality. I'm of the camp of, this is pretty much just a, a holographic image and it's how we perceive it that creates the form and the experience that we actually have. So, in, you know, as you're saying, every moment is a choice and you have that choice of making a choice, you know, choosing something that's of a higher vibrational na nature, you know, love, compassion, or a lower uh, vibrational nature, fear, separation. And it, it, it's even, even just small things all day long, we're making that choice. And so I do think that with the current climate that we're in, there's so much fear that makes it very easy for people to, to, to choose reactions to fear. And there's separation, divide. And so I, I do think there is more and more of a kind of a split happening in, in the people that are saying no to that and you know, creating in in on mass in, in in tribe, like you know what you're doing, how how we're connecting to, to to create this other way of living and being that just at some point is so out of alignment with the fear separation model that I don't know how it's going to work, but we almost won't even see each other. Oh yeah, I yeah, I, I that it's funny very similar thoughts uh, I, I, I have. And, and I was just talking to my wife yesterday and it, it was kind of in regards to, um, yeah, with, without kind of, there wouldn't be pointing fingers, but it was regards to the fear behavior, let's say that we see in others. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say when we take our son to the park, for example, and uh, um, how, uh, Sometimes when I'm when I'm around people that are, I sense are in a fear mindset, even if mm -hmm. they're not like in a bad mood or something, but they're just more oh, yeah. fearful and like overly cautious to the point where for me it's, I won't say laughable, but seems I just I can't relate. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, at that point, like I realize that, but I, but nobody's persecuting me. You know, I'm not standing out like. I almost feel like I have the ability to make myself invisible on some level, you know, like it's like I have this safety. I don't feel like the fearful group is going to attack me. Maybe because I do have a sense of love towards them and, mm -hmm. and that I'm not trying to impede on their freedom of choice. I know that, and I'm standing in my sovereignty. So I feel like I almost, and I, we talked to my wife about that and she agreed, she feels that a little bit too, that, her, I, and maybe my son too, have this kind of, I don't know, force field of protection, but like this ability to go invisible when we need to in, in, a, in a public place. Yeah. I think it's vibrational. I, I mean, I go back to energy and 
frequency. And I, li I literally think at, when you're vibrating at a certain level that they, you are almost invisible because it, it's the light. Mm -hmm. It's the light and love. And, 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 and in the dark places, you can't necessarily see that. And so I, I, th I think that there is, it is almost like a force field and it almost does make you invisible because it would be like, it, it, you become like kind of opaque. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. like say, it's, it, it, you're, you're almost like shimmering and opaque in such a way that, you know, somebody might kind of see something over there, but, but you're not in full form because you're not fully embodied in, in that fear based reality. And mm -hmm. so that, that's why I said, like, I, I really think in, on some level, we almost don't even see each other be, <laughs> because we're just vibrating out <laughs> of, you know, resonance. And, you know, you can, you can be in alignment to a certain degree, but then, you know, you just, you just can't see each other. And so it, whether it's, uh, you know, whether, you know, somebody could say that's, that's ridiculous. Like they're standing right there. I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're not physically present. I'm just saying that there's almost like a balance or an opaqueness to your being to others that are operating in a more fear, separation, control matrix field that, you know, it'd be, it'd be like, they can see you almost like on the peripheral, mm -hmm. but, but we're, you know, and, and that, and, 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 and then you on your side, you're allowing that to be by not engaging in some kind of like um, negative negativity or judgment about them that then brings you right back into that field. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so you're, you know, you're, you're not only mm -hmm. are you staying in what's true for you and your authentic energetic vibration, but you're also not walking along and judging those others who are on their journey, on their path and whatever, you know, is working for them. All you're just simply saying is I'm over here and, you know, love you, bless you, but I'm keeping you at an arm's distance because we're not on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, I, I love how uh, you, you explain that. I, that makes sense. And I, I totally do think that the, the whole, the, you know, that everything is vibration, right? Everything is light. Uh, music. I think it, it, it comes back to music, right? We're, we're learning, I think, in science, in certain, certain realms of science, how everything is vibrational and, and, and nothing is static at all. So the, the more, the faster we vibrate, the closer we are to light and uh, the lighter we become. And I think many of us can re would agree that feeling light lighter is better than feeling heavy, usually. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, if you're feeling very light, then maybe the heavier elements will just, you know, like they would just settle to the bottom, so to speak, and then the lighter would float up or, yeah, but they, they would not, they would not occupy actually the same space in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the same, it's similar to, you know, if, if you're inclined to believe in the, you know, possibility of, you know, conscious beings living at higher dimensional levels than ours. If you, if you look and you were to say, you know, we're at this, this third dimensional level, which is fairly dense because we have very dense form. Our bodies are very dense. And if you choose to believe that there may be other beings who live at much um, higher frequencies, maybe five, six, seven dimensional beings and beyond, we can't see them. Right. There's so mm -hmm. much in our world that, that, that I would, I would suggest coexists with us that we call the invisible world. We literally can't see them. Why can't we see them? Mm -hmm. Be because of this. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's the, the, the frequent, the vibrational frequency, the, the density of our world and theirs is so disparate that you can't really bridge it. But it's not to say that that, that, that consciousness, that energetic being might not be right, right beside you. Mm -hmm. And you can sense them. Perhaps you can even connect with them psychically if you're inclined and you have those skills. Or just like you being in the park, you don't see them at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to make, uh, do a shout out to uh, Melissa Morris, uh, who is watching. Uh, Melissa Morris was a guest on my show last week, and she's actually uh, was uh, one of my high school teachers. And she was 
guitar teacher there. So I learned things about the classical guitar through her and we uh, became friendly and, you know, so anyway, she's watching and she's letting us know that she's listening. So thanks for joining, <laughs> Melissa. Thanks for joining. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've seen, you know, I see we have numbers watching that are, you know, fluctuating as we go and this will live on to, you know, indefinitely uh, and people will see it on the replay, uh, but we still have a little more to go. And uh, Raimundo Carlos Salitown says, very nice. I am here in Brazil and I like that. Uh, he likes what we're talking about. So, hey, hey, Raimundo from Brazil. And Melissa says, uh, super interesting conversation. So, obrigado amigo. Yeah, Raimundo uh, was a, a friend who, he was our leader when Yoko and I uh, were volunteers, humanitarian volunteers in Brazil. And um, oh, wow. he speaks English well. And he, uh, he was a great uh, support for us there. I don't know what we would have done without him. So thank you so much, Raimundo, for being here. Um, yeah, so let's continue our super inter interesting conversation if you have some, <laughs> if you have some more energy. Uh, Andy? I do. All right, cool. So, um, so I, I, unless you think we covered it already, uh, can you describe what it was that inspired you to leave your known field of legal public service and venture into something completely new or pretty new, or certainly different with Sacred Dragon Publishing? How did that come to be? You know, it's really interesting, this segue, because my answer is vibrational. Yeah, wow. I was no longer able to function in that, that kind of fear control matrix that I, I felt, especially how um, my job changed with COVID. It was really interesting to see that. So before, <laughs> you know, I was doing the work that I, I like, the, the, the fraud prosecution, the kind of complex um, cases. Well, COVID comes along and suddenly uh, there's a task force that's all about prosecuting uh, people that are you know, illegally selling masks and uh, price gouging and things like that. I, I understand those are, you know, the, the, I'm not trying to say those are not things that harm people. But what was hard for me was that um, the targets of most of those cases were just mom and pops types businesses trying to figure it out because on some level, that's the low hanging fruit. And I don't really want to get in that too much, but I think you get the gist of it is mm -hmm. that there are certainly much bigger targets doing much worse things, but the low hanging fruit was the guy on the corner selling masks. And I happened to be somebody that bought masks from the guy on the corner because you know what? I couldn't find anywhere else. So I didn't have a problem giving him four bucks for a mask that he probably under price gouging law should have only charged three. <laughs> I think, you know, so, so I became very upset about that use of our resources and my time. So that was part of it, but it was part of a continuing, um, th uh, continuing experience of not being able, just getting almost ill, literally physically ill, going from my life at home and, and the things that, that I do and bringing myself into that fear control matrix of the you know, government bureaucracy criminal justice system. So it, it, was, it was exactly what we were just talking about. I vibrated out of it. <laughs> wow, perfect. And, uh, just a little quick comment. So Melissa Mars says, much easier to get them than to get than it is to get the bigger guy. So. And what's fascinating, Melissa, is that um, all in my career, all my, my, you know, 20 years, we were always very conscious about that. Like, is this the right target? Um, and my cases were mostly against either corporations or, you know, people of substance that are making, you know, that are harming a lot of people, mm -hmm. not just, you know, a block of people, you know, or, or a neighborhood. So you're right. It, it, that, that was, that was very much in my mind out of alignment with what I signed up to do and uh, certainly out, out of alignment with my soul. 
Yeah, and she, she said, uh, nice to know there was someone with a conscious in the system, you, and then, but then you left it. <laughs> so, but I think that I actually, you know, I think that's, that says a lot, not that you left it, um, that there was something wrong with that, but when, when, once someone is no longer in alignment with the way the system operates, you can't stay there. I think yeah. it's like you're almost forced out vibrationally. Not, not by. Yeah, I, I was like literally getting ill. <laughs> right, right, by your own physical response, which has happened to me in my own, uh, in a few different, res uh, in a few different areas since uh, COVID, and it was unpleasant. I can think of three instances. It was unpleasant, but I was so grateful. I'm like, ah, this is icky. I don't want to go through this, but being on the other side is going to be better because I just am not in alignment with this thing that I was in alignment with before just no longer. I guess that's kind of the split that we're talking about, right? That is the 5D, 3D split. That's what it feels like, I guess, you know, on some Yeah, level. and yeah. But then, um, yeah, so, you know, I had seen this coming for a while and I, I knew I had actually tried to kind of tried to retire be earlier um, in, in 2019 um, and things just didn't really line up correctly for that. So I, I, was, I was still, I, I didn't leave at that time but in, anyways in 2019 I was starting to build a, okay what am I going to do after I retire because I, I had no intention of like retiring and not not working or not being productive and doing something I felt passionate about so my original concept was that I was going to be a writer because I enjoy writing and I you know did this whole thing about being a writer and then as I was kind of working in that you know doing that in my free time I started checking out about you know publication or publishing and like what what it you know how do you get published like what even is that all about and um so i had kind of started my my wheels had kind of started turning about well maybe i might want to work with a, in a publishing house to kind of get a little bit more of a feel about that side of the business as well as the writing so as i was leaving uh doj i was telling people you know that they're asking you like because i've kind of young to be retiring and they were really wondering what am I doing and I just said I'm I'm going into publishing but I had no idea what I actually meant when I said it but this is what I'm saying about you know we do we or is it possible that somehow we connect with other other pieces parts of ourselves other aspects of ourselves past concurrent lives um you know but at some point this whole publishing business just became very real and very solid within me. And I'm telling you, I, I, my last day with the Department of Justice was the last day of December 2020. And um, by literally the second week of January, I had my first client. Wow. As a publisher and editor. And what's interesting is um, the skill set for that is kind of like what I felt with Buddhism. When I was doing the chanting and all that, it was just there. I could speak this language that I had no, I'd never, in this lifetime, I'd never heard. Mm -hmm. I could do the prayer beads in ways that like, I never learned that. Mm -hmm. I like making mandalas, all these different parts about Buddhism. Same thing with the military. Nobody in my family had been in the military. How is it that I know how to do all this crazy combat stuff? What the heck? <laughs> Where did that come from, right? right? Same thing kind of happened with this in that um, it just fell into place easily, gracefully, and met amazing people like yourself and began building the ship as I started sailing it. And it's just been... Um, an amazing connection with some part of myself that's just very joyful and very happy to be expressing with me right now. Yeah, man, what, what a great story. I'm so glad that, uh, that I asked you to be on the show and that you said yes, you know, because your story is, I mean, I sensed you're a super cool person, you know, when I first saw you. Um, and then when you started talking about your new, new business and, you know, with, with a very uh, real sense of humility, it wasn't like it was very, you're very approachable, you know, and I thought that was wonderful and um, a healthy sense, you know, of humility. Uh, but I could see you had something special brewing, you know, so 
Yeah. Um, well, you were a big part of me too, because I, you know, I, I, I was very honest. <laughs> I think at that event is where I like actually kind of announced, you know, that this is what I'm doing. And um, so I was very open that this is a startup and uh, you and I had had a little bit of a conversation that, you know, you were interested in, uh, you, you had some projects. And so we had, we had a wonderful exchange and I learned from, I learned a lot from you and I learned from my clients and I'm, you know, that that's part of my passion is, I'm not doing things this way. I'm doing things a lot of ways that support the people that I'm working with because we're creating something new and something different. And um, it's going to look and feel different. And there's not one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th that was that I, I'm very open to what works to support you and you bringing in your messages and helping, you know, get, get that, that book out there that, um, is going to light up the world. Right. And by you, you do mean me, but you also mean any, any writer that, that is, that you're working with. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So the, I just want the the listener time. to know that they're talk, you're talking about them too. Um, absolutely. And, and that's, like I said, there's no one way of doing this. There's no one no. way of doing this. Not, not with me. It's, yeah. it's going to be unique to what you need and what works for us working together. Yeah, which is very beautiful. I, I definitely recognize with you that you have a flexibility that's uncommon. And I, I think it, it's kind of what it's the way the, the world is. We're all unique. So why not? Right. Why make cookie cutter things when to, to feed, you know, not to feed, but to uh, cater to masses when we don't have to cater to masses. You know, we could do one to one thing in a sustainable way that make it and make a difference, you know? Yeah. I just wanna share that. Uh, so Melissa says uh, a few things. She said, Melissa and Laura said, uh, yes, questions. I have the same questions. I'm not sure. I think that was like when you were kind of thinking about um, your transition and what were you, what were you thinking? Maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, and then yes, like you, John, when I was saying how, uh, the way you work that, that so I guess you were saying we're similar in that way. And uh, yeah, I, Melissa is also someone who learns Melissa Morris as, as a guitar teacher, music teacher for, for many years now. And she learns from her students. She has that sense like similar to yourself. She's not going to just speak down or, or speak to someone. She's going to uh, create a relationship. That's why she's one of these cool teachers who she was my teacher, but she's my friend now. And yeah. she can do that she's done that with a lot of people so that that's a type of very special uh human beings that i think this world needs people who like yourself like melissa morris uh like me i would say who want to actually see people as equals what can we learn from each other how can we help each other because when we help each other we do help all of us all of us you know and i think the other thing i would say too is that it's it's a different I think it's a different paradigm. We've been like in my life, starting out as a model at 14, I was shown a world that's based on transaction, commercial transactions, right? So it, it, it's, it, it's, it's about the, the transaction and it wasn't about the people. And so for me, in, in now, you know, being a business owner again, and, and you and it sounds like Melissa as well, we're, we're saying, yes, there is a business transaction to this, you know, like th there's a business involved in getting the books out, but that's the consequence of the personal connection of the creativity it's not, it's not uh, like, it's, it's, it's kind of a cart before the horse thing, right? There, there, there's the connection, there's the creativity, there's the, 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 the what we're, we're creating together that results in a book and result, and, 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 and there's this, this business side of it that, that's there, but it's the, it's, that's, that's not the focus. On, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, it's a reverse. We've, we've been trained to look at the commercial transaction and the end result, the financial piece and, and this commercial side of it first, and then, you know, fill in the blanks. I, I don't believe that. I believe that that's the result of uh, what we're creating. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember for me, uh, 
as a musician, putting out music, trying to sell anything when I was selling my books independently uh, to students and stuff. I never wanted anyone to buy something from me who didn't really want it. <laughs> so I was a terrible business person in a sense because uh, I would offer it and like almost encourage. No, I, I got to the point I was able to encourage people to buy something if I thought they really could buy it. But if I didn't have faith in that, I, I just couldn't push it because I just think it's a waste of paper or a waste of plastic or a waste of somebody's dollars because I know things that I purchase that just sit on the shelf and occupy my like my mental space because they're there and I don't use it, you know, so I don't want to do that to anybody. And I'm so glad that I'm, I'm living in a time where we could evolve past that, where we could actually live in a place where what we have is what we need. Or, or, and what we need is what we have. And it doesn't have to be, we don't have to stockpile things that we don't need, you know? Yep. Yeah, I'm all about decluttering mentally as well as, as physically. And, and also just this energetic, this just beneficial, mutually beneficial energetic exchange, you know? Love it. So um, it's getting late. I don't want to keep you too long. Right. Uh, so Melissa does say that uh, it's never as beautiful an outcome if there isn't that community connection. Yeah, that, right. that's always just, yeah, otherwise you don't remember it. You don't remember it if there's no community. You, don't, you know, because, and, and again, I go back to kind of like that energetic imprint that's on it. If it's just kept at this kind of like business transactional level, it doesn't it doesn't carry with it the vibrational imprint that you know has the potential to make much more of a difference mm -hmm. yeah so as you know i'm a strong believer in the power of music so can you share from your experience how music has positively influenced your life it was so funny i you know we had chatted about that a little bit the other day and i was telling you that i didn't even really pay that much attention to how much music is in my life on a daily basis until you asked me, you know, you said, what is music for you? And when you asked me that question and I reflected, music is in my life all day long. And it, and, um, it, 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 you know, but in it's different types of music for different types of feelings that, are, that I, that I have or different things that I'm doing. And so, um, Yes, it's a huge part of my life in a way that I didn't really even appreciate until you asked me to stop and think about it for a minute. And one of the things I shared was um, I, I love one of the types of music I love is opera music because I don't know why for me, um, I, I just love the, the fineness of it. And I know a lot of people really don't like opera music and I get it, but um, it's something that I particularly enjoy listening to when I'm cooking because it brings out this really kind of like fine artist, creative cook side of me. That's, that's very much, that's very fun instead of kind of like, you know, slapping together a meal. So um, yeah. And then I, like I was saying earlier, I enjoy pop music. I'm a Bieber fan on some levels. If I just want to kind of be bop around town. Um, I love French cafe music. And I find that um, I listen to that a lot while I'm working. Um, yeah, so lots of different, di lots of different types of music. And of course, meditation. I love like the, having a little bit of meditation music in the background while I'm uh, contemplating or just sitting in reflection. So it, it comes into my life quite a bit. And you'll, you'll laugh at this. When I was in the Miss America contest pageants, mm -hmm. my talent was singing. Oh, really? And I wrote my own songs. <laughs> Oh, wow, look at that. And um, a couple of them were guitar, like, uh, you know, kind of uh, ballad type songs. And then others were more jazzy, bluesy kind of things. But yeah, it made me think about that too. Like, oh my gosh, when I was, you know, performing, it was music. Who knew? <laughs> uh, and did you play guitar too or someone accompanied mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's so funny. And, and it's just like, I hadn't thought about that for decades. And then when you asked me the whole thing about music, I'm like, wow, that was my talent, music and playing guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it can be subtle, but it, it's really, uh, yeah, you know, I, I had this one thing about music. My father, my father passed away when I was six. He was 36. And uh, um, so I inherited with my brother and mother, 
a huge book collection and huge comic book collection and a love of the Lord of the Rings amongst a few other things. But he didn't love music. Uh, I mean, he, he appreciated it, but he didn't have, there was no record collection that he left behind, you know? So he obviously didn't love it on the level of books and ideas and stories. And uh, so I wondered to myself, why do I love music so much? Um, I'm like, did I just choose to for some reason or do I actually love it? You know, I, I couldn't tell. But every time I, I put it on, I just, I'm so happy. I love it. So it's just this, it's, you know, my mom likes music and whatever. It doesn't have to be justified, but I was thinking like, I wonder for people who don't love music actively, you know, how they they fill their space or how my father did with, with books instead. Um, anyway, just, just, just a, a side thought. Yeah, I, I think something is, that's interesting about music um, for me is um, cause I'm very energetically sensitive. And when uh, the music helps me harmonize my environment, I mm. realize that because especially downtown Los Angeles, <laughs> it's very chaotic energy, right? And, and mm. uh, very dense. <laughs> mm. And um, so I find that the music helps, helps me kind of uh, harmonize my environment and bring it in, into a, a resonance that then I can relax. Mm -hmm. Right. And probably people in your environment, if they hear music that they can relate to, it would kind of mellow them out too. So, yeah, yeah, you know, it's exactly. Yeah. In a dense environment, people can have that. The medium of music is very helpful to uh, mm -hmm. find like a homeostasis. So a friend of mine, Constantine chimed in. Constantine Mediuk said, mutually beneficial exchange of energy right on. Yeah, so he's a, he's actually a, a, a nurse. Um, so he's been working behind the scenes, uh, all, you know, through the pandemic and just that's has been his job and he's also a great bass player and uh and good you know good good, good old-fashioned guy <laughs> good friend yes. and father, father in his own right and uh he said music does help organize the environment wonderful um so i, I, I want to say something i'm sorry yeah yeah yeah. i was gonna ask you another question but well, uh, let me just i, I would just want to comment yes. quickly on the um, beneficial exchange of energy so I have this funny thing about wordplay. And so um, be, right? The word like be, being, mm. be. It's missing the other E, beneficial exchange of energy. That's, 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 and bees. So I, I just, I just find that funny. Another, another one that kind of came up, comes up with me is, is alone. If you add the extra L that should be there, it's all one. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it just, I just kind of have these funny, these funny little, mm -hmm. sometimes I think, you know, the world that we live in is a little inverted and there's words that, that, that lose their full meaning because somewhere along the line, just a letter has been taken out. And so mm -hmm. for B, the missing letter is beneficial exchange of energy alone to all one. So anyway. So as if, as if, B as if like B E E would stand for beneficial exchange of energy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like what if that's what if that's what it means to be to be to be a being and and being is a beneficial exchange of energy. Yeah. yeah. With others and with our environment, and and we get we lost that the full potential of that meaning because an E was dropped out. Mm -hmm. And also with dropping out the E, we forgot how important the actual, the insect, the bee is to us. And we're willing to uh, sacrifice it for yeah. progress and then going to, you know, suffer food shortages or whatever the heck will happen if, if the bee goes extinct. And what if the dropped out E was the exchange part? So we get mm -hmm. the being and the energy being, but by that extra E being dropped out, we lost the exchange part. And that's exactly where we are with the separation put the E back in unity, put the L back in alone, all one unity. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of interesting. It's just a word play. But I'm saying it's kind of interesting how you, sometimes you start looking at our language because language is vibrational and uh, you know, just, just seeing how perhaps somewhere along the line language has been um, changed a bit to take out some of the full potential. Even our language has to unify, not separate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a one of the 
one of my favorite YouTubers is a guy named, and thought leaders, I would say, a guy named Infinite Waters. And he says, he does a lot of these things that he'll catch. He, he's a bit of a wordsmith too. But one thing he says, it's not a particular wordplay, but he says, um, you know, human beings are designed to be loved and things are designed to be used. But instead we love our iPhones and we use people. That's the world we're in. Yeah, yeah. You know? inverted. Like it's yes. funny, like we're just slightly off. Like it's missing the extra E. It's, <laughs> it's, we've got things flipped around. Like I was saying with business and commerce, we put that first instead of the personal connection, which is, which then the, the business results from that. So yeah, it's kind of like, I just, I just have this kind of like inverted world theory sometimes. Oh yeah, that, that, if, if you ever inspired to check out Infinite Waters, please do. He's, he's, he always talks about uh, this, the um, matrix is, is uh, backwards. Everything is backwards in the matrix. And he goes into words sometimes, uh, you know, uh, evil, right? Evil is, is live backwards, you know? <laughs> what? I know, it's, it's really interesting when you start going down this rabbit hole of language. Yeah. <laughs> But I do like the all one. I, I don't know if I ever fully recognized that before, that it could be that. Yeah. Well, it's really profound for me because I do, um, at this particular mo moment in my life, I'm alone quite a bit. And I was struggling with that. And then it just hit me the other day, all one. So now every time I start, I, I kind of have that thought of alone. I'm like, all one, I'm, 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 I'm with everybody. We are all together. This is a unity consciousness world, if you choose it. Yeah. Yeah, I think Infinite Waters basically explain. He would just say he's he, he's one of the authors that I modeled uh, one of the books I have in mind for. Um, he, he's I think he only he put out two books, and one of them is very rough in terms of like polish, but it's still very inspiring because it's so rough. He's like, these are my ideas, bam, and I'm gonna put it out. He put it out when he was in his early twenties by himself, mid twenties, and uh, you know, it took courage to do that and. Um, sorry, I forgot the specific, specific point I was going to say, but anyway, yeah, he's, he's, he's alone by himself and a lot and he, him and other leaders, uh, thought leaders, and he's, he's a younger than me guy. Uh, he's very dark Brown, but he talks about racial issues. And I mentioned it because like, he'll say black lives matter. All yes, all lives matter. You know, I've never met a black person in my life. I've never met a white person in my life, right? I mean, literally, there's no white or black people. This is just words. And, you know, so he gets into that. And, and that race is a, a theory created by a guy named Blumen back in the 1700s to uh, divide us. And, like, he, he goes That's... into stuff. So he, he's a lot of fun to listen to. Um, like, even that word, race, what do we, what's the race? To, yeah. to, for one group to, to out, outpace the other? D d even that concept brings in like some competition. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's amazing like to, to see how, it, you know, again, just, just so much of what we've been, what we just kind of take for granted and the words that, that we put out, they, they kind of, you know, contribute to these issues that we're dealing with right now. Competition, separation, you know, alone. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, so yeah, just a couple of thoughts. One, one of the guy, I met a guy on a beach one time. He was actually ex-military. He was like a surfer dude, older guy, really fit. But he's like, he's like, yeah, you got to check out the language, man. The word nice, actually, if you look into the history of it, it means stupid. So when someone calls you nice, they're calling you stupid. And I, I never quite looked into the history, etymology of the word, but, but he was convinced that like, there's a lot of words that are brainwashing us. Like when you say you're nice, I, I could kind of get it. You know, you're nice. Oh, that's nice. You're kind of like dulling a person down to to be a good follower, you know, type of thing. Oh. Um, but I, yeah, that that's what I remember that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, there was one other point I was going to share, but um, yeah. Anyway, it'll come to me. Uh, so, if you wouldn't mind, what aspects of your life philosophy help you recover from setbacks? We all go through setbacks. What gets you through it? I think mostly it's service, being in service. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like um, you know, I've, I've been in public service all my life and now I feel like I'm serving, it's very much still in public service in a little bit of a different way. 
but um, looking for how am I serving? And if I'm not serving, then, then I'm done. So like, you know, the challenge in the desert there, um, you know, out of that came a whole career of public service as, as an attorney. And, you know, that the whole field I talked about there. So it, it's really when I'm at my lowest, it's, it's checking in to see how can I serve? What am I here to serve? And uh, the greater good. Um, and, and what is, what is my, what is, what is the life journey question before me? And am I going to resolve it so that I'm not dragging it around for the rest of my, you know, future lives and the rest of this life? Or am I just going to, you know, put it away? And so I, I do, I try and, you know, find meaning in those challenging moments because I think it's a pretty common experience that in those challenging moments is sometimes where we have our greatest awakenings. And so, yeah, it's, it's those two, two points, um, really asking what's going on here, what's being shown to me, what is the life lesson on earth school? <laughs> I, I, I think we're all in earth school. And um, then out of this, how do I serve? How do I help that? How do I take this and bring it into my service to humanity? So, yeah, it, it sounds like fundamentally you believe that there's, uh, if not meaning in life, that there's value in living, that it's worth, living is worthwhile, right? Sounds on some Yeah, I mean, as, as I, I think that, I think that our, you know, for me, like I, like I said, I kind of have this idea of earth school and we come here and we have lots of lessons to learn and we uh, learn those lessons. Sometimes, sometimes those lessons are years, learned in a very short life. Sometimes they're learned in a very long life, but there, there is a kind of purpose and evolutionary opportunity that we have in this human form. And um, when we are in, when I'm in those challenges, you know, that's the question, how, how do I serve? Am I serving best here? Or is this time to go serve in some other way? And, you know, through working through that question and then understanding what my earth school lesson was, um, you know, brings me to resolution and I'm still here. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that reminds me of a Rosa Parks quote. Uh, Rosa Parks, uh, I think, was in her book said, uh, when I'm getting down and feeling sorry for myself and like things are not working out the way that I want them to, I just, you know, look up and say, who can I help today? Or how can I serve? And then I, I feel better. And you right. take action to do that. And, and then we see that, wow, Life isn't necessarily designed just to serve me. <laughs> uh, I very much. I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's, there's two components, right? There's the, the personal life lessons of our school, and then there's the service piece. And if you're, if you've chosen a path of service to others, then that's a, you know, a very real and important part of, you know, why you're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I want, I just remembered. So when you said be, be one, no, sorry, alone is all one. Um, I've been reading uh, a lot of Thomas Merton this past, this year, 2021, for whatever reason, it's been on my father's shelf. I always had an affinity towards if I picked it up, I never actually really just grabbed him and read him. And uh, I read his, his biography, it, which helped me, I might've told you this, I don't know, which helped me to realize the genre of my autobiography, which is, um, I think it's called spiritual journey or something like that. Because mm -hmm. I had like the rock star path, uh, rock star, it just that was like the model I was working with. And I just knew it didn't work, but I didn't know what it was. So like spiritual journey is kind of what my life story is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's arguably what everyone's is, but this is what the story I want, I want to tell. Anyway, so that's, that was Thomas Merton's life. Are you familiar with Thomas Merton? I've, I haven't read anything of his works. I've heard of him, but no. Okay, so he, someone you'd definitely be interested to know about, I think. Yeah. He, he was born 1915-ish, and he was like a product of World War I. He was, a, he was in, born, born in France. He came to America at the age of two or something, or one, because they wanted to get out of Europe during World War I. And... Uh, then his mother died when he was a kid. Then his father died when he was a teenager. His brother died in the war. I guess it was World War II when he was in his 20s or something. So he ended up being basically an orphan. Uh, and 
he, I don't know what his original religion was, but it wasn't Catholic, but something drew him to Catholicism. And he, he, he it was a bit of the, a bit of a Buddhist story. Like he, he was a, he wandered around and lived the lustful pleasure, life of pleasure. And then he decided that for him, he wanted to become a Trappist monk. So to go the other extreme, to really become someone who is, lives in a monastery. Mm -hmm. And so he did that and he was accepted and, but he was a writer before that he was teaching. And somehow the, the leader of the Buddhist, uh, sorry, the, the Trappist monastery um, uh, allowed him to continue writing, which is very rare because it's a very like uh, limited life, not supposed to be public. And, um, but they saw that this would probably be best for him and probably good press for, for, for us, the, the, the monastery. They, they needed some public uh, relations to help their cause. And uh, so he, he wrote as a monk and he wrote a lot and it tortured him, but this was his life. And it, he, he's, he, he's a contemplative, the most well-known contemplative in the Catholic tradition for sure in the 20th century. And uh, he, his, light, his words are very uh, clear. They, they sound Buddhist, they sound Catholic, they sound universal, you know? And um, so it just rem reminded me how he, 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 one thing he said was that when I'm, when I'm uh, with people, I always feel alone. And when I'm uh, alone, I always feel at one with God. So it reminded me of, of that and, and he, but he really felt it, you know, he tried human relations, you know, with a woman and whatever, it just, it didn't, it wasn't what he was here for in this lifetime, in that lifetime, you know, mm -hmm. and then he eventually did get to leave, leave America and he went to visit uh, the East uh, on a tour to kind of, he met with Thich Nhat Hanh and I think he met the Dalai Lama. So, like he was very, he started to speak out, protest against the war and stuff. And the Catholic Church did not want him to do that. They were against him doing that. And uh, he died in a really random sort of accident at a relatively young age. But he, he his journey was over, you know. Um, but anyway, that contemplative life of being alone as being potentially as fulfilling as, as a, a, a life where you're not alone, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what occurred to me when you said that was that, well, yeah, because that's what the all one is, that you, 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 you are all one with the divine. Mm -hmm. like, like, that, that, like when you open in, in that space, in that space of being, you know, alone, you open up to the connection with the divine more possibly, yeah. right? Because, because you're not you're not in the kind of engagement with, with the district, not, not distractions, but with, with, you know, the kind of other people around and just, you know, you're in that contemplative, the opportunity for, for a lot of contemplation, that contemplative space. And so what does all one mean? It, it is that connection with the divine or God or, you know, however uh, Mertens is explaining it, but um, yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I just read last night that he said it's when, you know, when he seeks God or he, he does his prayers or whatever way you, you, it's traditionally you think you're supposed to find. God. And he always complains about his writing at this time and era at this moment. It's just that it's like he can't not write. And sometimes he just wishes he, he could and just be a monk working in the fields. But his plot his, is to be a writer and alone, too. They would give him, allowed him to live outside of the brotherhood. And as a hermit, they allowed that. And for him to write, it was like it was a special case. But uh, he said, when I'm sitting and I write, and I just write from my heart, sometimes without noticing, I, I realize God's sitting next to me. Mm. So that that's yeah. you know, it, it's just it's pretty beautiful, and and uh, gives me a whole different perspective on a, what aloneness actually is. That it is actually more closer to all one than being disconnected. You know. Right. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. And uh, coming to a close here. Um, I know you probably got to eat dinner and uh, I'm all right. I'm so having fun. So can you share up to three inspiring books, films, or TV shows that you would like to recommend to our listeners? You know, let's say we just came through the, the year plus pan pandemic situation and maybe people are feeling a bit down. Maybe they want something 
to uplift them? Anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I know this is kind of a funny one, but um, I would really encourage, you know, anyone interested to watch the movie Black Panther from a 5D perspective. It's pretty extraordinary. And uh, if you recall, there's that, that land of Wakanda, right? And they mm -hmm. live this higher conscious, unity conscious kind of way of living and being. And they're on the planet, but they're in that invisible space like we were talking about before, mm -hmm. right? But then when they you know, are discovered or they come out to help the world, then they then they, then they you know come out and and they they bring some beautiful um, technology and ways of living and being to the rest of the world. I think that's a super uplifting and inspiring movie. <laughs> I, and I know it's just a silly Marvel thing, but look at it maybe from a different perspective. Arrival is another one that I think has a very profound message for humanity in this context of what does it mean to communicate? What does it mean to uh, the, the way that we use language, how our language is very linear, linear and that keeps us in this kind of linear uh, concept of time and space. In that movie, the beings that, are, that interact with the humans look at things in, in, a, in a sphere, a circular way. And um, I think that opens up some possibilities for maybe seeing beyond this kind of linear view that we have. And then um, in terms of books, I. I love a lot of books, so I'm really more about the authors. My favorite author is Pearl Buck, and she and there's a, a new Japanese writer who's kind of following her footsteps that I'm kind of excited about, and her name is uh, Yoko Nagawa. Um, so if, if you're a reader, um, those are kind of two authors that I, it's kind of like fun. This you know Pearl Buck is no longer with us, but then this younger gal came along and she's picking up that same style, and it's. It's really wonderful. Um, I do kind of enjoy sci-fi and fantasy um, as well. So my my uh, one of my favorite sci-fi writer, writers is Adrian Tchaikovsky. His use of um, description and uh, just storytelling is unbelievable. I, I really love him. And then just kind of if I just want to sit down and curl up, I, I still love N.K. Jemison. He's got a huge library of work and she's just fun. So that's N kind of my N K Jemison. N K Jemison. Yep. I'm just getting a, a pen here. Uh, I should have had it handy, but um, so Pearl Buck. Uh, what what era is she? I, I'm curious. She would have been. Uh, I think she passed away in the '60s. So you know, most of her work is you know. Uh, 19, uh, 1900, 1950, that, that era, that time period, okay. probably like more 1930, 1950s. But her, but her work is, uh, takes place, um, like the, it's, it's a lot of kind of like historical fiction of, um, of China. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, 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 it so the, the stories are wonderful, but it's just, it's just a writing style. And then, like I said, this, this, this now, this uh, Yoko Nagawa, um, a young Japanese writer is, I picked up one of her books the other day. I was like, oh my gosh, it was like, is this Pearl Buck coming through Yo yeah, Yoko? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of fun. Cool. So uh, Black Panther, Arrival, uh, and then for authors, Pearl Buck, Yoko Nigawa, N.K. Jemison? N.K. Jemison, and then Adrian Tchaikovsky. Adrian Tchaikovsky. Just, yeah, like the musician spelling oh, Tchaikovsky okay um is that a woman or, or a male or a man? it's a male mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that could be a check all uh, right cool yeah arrival I did see a long time ago um uh and then Black Panther I saw probably on the on a flight to Japan actually um yeah I, I was totally uh blown away by it um I could see the spiritual element of it, which is probably what I liked about it. And also yeah. touching the race theme in, in, a, in a good way, I felt that yeah. that era, which was relevant. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, that I liked it for that piece too. And um, I really do think that our African-American and just our African brothers and sisters are, have so much to offer. And uh, it's just, it's just, it's time. So I, I think that mm -hmm. that movie does, you know, honors that in a really good way.
Yeah, yes, yes. In, uh, um, in the SGI and the form of Buddhism I practiced, uh, our sensei, our mentor, President Ikeda, has often said that the 21st, right, we're in 21st, 21st century is the year of Africa, uh, as well as the year of women, uh, the, the century of women and century of Africa, that this is how we're going to flip to a, to a really new way of being a peaceful era where nuclear weapons are no longer on the planet yeah. uh, is by honoring the voice of Africa doesn't literally just mean Africans, but like basically the, those who've been suppressed yes. honoring those voices and on the planet and, and certainly women's voices, which are included in that, which we, you know, women, women are mothers, right? So mothers are women. So, they inherently honor life because they hold life and there's a, a deeper connection and, and men tend to, you know, historically do things a little more aggressively, right? So if we at least found a balance to, to incorporate women's wisdom, uh, I'm sure it couldn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on my, on my, uh, one, if you go to my website, you'll see um, the inspiration for sacred dragon publishing is kind of the yin, yin yang fig, configuration of two dragons mm -hmm. and um because that that's very uh, much that's something that's that's very very important to me and something that i'm very passionate about is the balancing of masculine and feminine energy and um so i'm i'm about the balance i appreciate that you know we need more feminine energy to kind of counterbalance the prevalence of masculine energy but in my mind what we're really my what I'm seeking is it a balance of the ma is the masculine and feminine energy in balance, mm -hmm. and um, so yeah, and and uh, of course that that extends to, you know, all all peoples. But th this concept of the balance of masculine and feminine energy, I think, is is very is very significant as we evolve. Yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah, I, I mean, we can go into that too. I remember reading one book written by a woman. <laughs> yeah. I'll try not to go too far off. One book written by a woman when I was in Brazil, it was about uh, ancient Egypt, how like the goddess and, and like it's, it's a, it written by a woman empowering women. And it was cool to read, but I remember her message was like for women to truly step into their power. It's important for them not to, try to just take on the roles that men do to learn what is their role and fully step into it and women tend to be good at being the whole ground to to allow many things to grow and or to like really like hold space for a lot and men tend to be more focused and like they build tall buildings right <laughs> so men tend to like yeah. dig deep or dig up and focus on something and women can hold a lot of space for men to do that so a woman in fully in her power, this is the, this is what a woman's words not like a woman fully in her power is one who could truly support men and that really comes down to love too because when a woman doesn't give love to the men in her life men don't act good <laughs> you know men need that men need love for to act pro behave properly you know so that's part of what keeps the balance is women just truly being women uh, holding uh, the being the earth and then also for, for men to grow in a healthy way and the love like this the uh, the sun doesn't you know hold withhold its love from anyone to be that son of love so that people feel seen people feel recognized you know men always like yeah look at me mom look i'm gonna build this thing and you know, look at me i'm look what i can do if the men are paying attention to then maybe you know they won't want to act out of go out of bounds to get attention you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> that was like kind of the argument of the book and i thought that was pretty interesting yeah and i think like for me i kind of take it to the next level and i look at it more as um but like you know another way of looking at it is more of like masculine uh you know divine masculine divine feminine energy so it's not necessarily um, a male female thing in terms of you know men and women um, it, it's each of us have that opportunity in and of ourselves to find and balance masculine and feminine energy in ourselves and ultimately at some level we become a bit uh, like like the, the gender 
connection to male and female is, is not as strong as we perceive it to be at this time. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that, that makes perfect sense. I, I, I was just remembering that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was an interesting thing to to kind of perceive the, the larger. But that was a, the book was written a while ago and it might have been written early 80s or something. So it was had, you know, there was a different need to spread that message, I suppose. But, yeah, and it's an evolution, John. It's an evolution, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, a anything that that that's empowering, <laughs> I think it's. But, but I, I think j just just as I was, you know, just in in what I was saying about that balance, I was just kind of giving it that veneer of you know something beyond the concept of gender. Yeah, and I, I totally agree that each one of us has male and female energy. It's it's only natural, um, and that uh, some of us have a lot closer to a 50-50% thing than, than being heavily male or heavily female, especially in our culture where we don't, men don't have to use their muscles to, to yeah. do the job anymore. And women don't have to be relegated to uh, tasks that are whatever, that, that are unlike men. We could do many similar jobs now, you know, and exist. So, uh, I anyway, just want to let you know um, or share with the audience that Melissa Morris said women need love as well, uh, but we also need to space or need space to be our most authentic selves. Yeah, I think that's a message that's coming up a lot for me recently. Um, not for me as a woman, but for me <laughs> as a, although I do have long hair, right? You do, but, as I know. <laughs> but for me, and I've got short hair. <laughs> right, there you see, there you go. Right, yeah, I definitely detect that our probably yin yang balance. Yeah. We're both probably, I don't know, kind of close to 50 50. I haven't maybe, but yeah, but you know, I, I don't feel like I'm heavily masculine, but I am a guy, you know, I recognize that. But uh, I know that I was raised by women, I didn't really have male figures, so I have a lot of feminine energy. I would attribute it to that, probably, but or whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, I think uh, so. I was in this book program, book writing program, and I've had some guests from that book program. And a lot of these are women that want to spread a message and write a book. And a lot of the women, uh, I'm sure some will be watching this now or in the, or in the future, <clears throat> have a message that's to empower other women, basically with what Melissa Mar said, which is that uh, women need space to be their authentic selves. And a lot of times society will put a lot of pressure for various roles, your mother, yep. your, your daughter, your wife, you, you know, your uh, best friend, and then, then whatever roles you take on in your, in your job or, or, in, or in community, can you work the PTA, whatever, you know, the, so women may have all these roles put on them. They, they totally forget, especially when you're a mother with, with multiple kids, they can have the potential to forget who they are. Yeah, I mean, th I think a, a strong part of the, you know, feminine, you know, divine feminine energy is that that nurturing and giving peace. And, uh, I, I, you know, it, it can can be a struggle to find balance in, in that situation when you're when you're feel and, and, you know, the very your very soul wants to be nurturing and giving. But then you're you know, you have to find that balance to where you're um, nurturing and caring for yourself, too. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course it, it applies to men as well in a different way, perhaps. But uh, yeah, I mean, men, men. I would say the the masculine or the typical scenario for men would be uh, that we're encouraged to not show emotions or to be wear a tough exterior, and therefore we're forgetting that we have to give ourselves love. Or you know, the topic of trauma has been coming up. I had get my last guest with Diane Spindler. She we discussed trauma and that you know, when you can acknowledge trauma, then you could work with it. And then you could even alleviate it potentially and, or make, you know, heal it. So then you could love and be more fully expressed, but trauma is like a cutting off. And when we don't acknowledge that we're hurt, like for me, my father died when I was six, that's a traumatic experience. It's a trauma, but I was taught at some point, whether someone said it to me or not, I was like, well, if I keep on bringing this up, I'm just like abusing it. Like I'm just, it's just a story at this point get over it. But, you know, I had to grow up, uh, grow up early. You know, I was the, the man of the house kind of because I had a younger brother and I was a mother. I was the only, it was three in a house. It was kind of scary. You know, you hear about kidnapping and robbery in the, in the eighties, you know, and you're like, 
I'm in New York City. So yeah. it was scary. Anyway, point, point being, if more men have the opportunity to see that they can care about their themselves and love themselves or taught how to do that or taught that it's normal, uh, then we'd probably have a lot less violence, a lot less crime. You yeah. know, if they were recognized as being beautiful beings. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as, as much as we're talking about empowering women, you know, how about empowering men to step into like a higher and way of being male and stepping into more of a divine masculine power? Because, you know, I, I, I totally see that too, that on the, on the male side, that, you know, their, our definition of masculine is completely out of alignment just as much as our definition of feminine is completely out of alignment with, you know, our true nature. So, so I, I very much um, love working with men and want, would love to see more out there, any authors out there who were interested. I'd love to see some authors come forward with some, some uh, books and uh, wisdom around um, helping to uh, ignite and empower and spark the masculine divine or the divine masculine so that men feel more empowered to step into their new way of living, you know, higher and, and higher ways of living and being. So all this focus is, you know, like, like women, you know, and, and I agree, I'm not, I'm not, but, but, but it, 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 it worked, it, it's both. <laughs> and so I, I would love to see some authors come forward with more on that. Because you don't yeah. you don't really see that much of that yet, and it's 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 really important right now. You know, it, it, we're, we're kind of like you were saying, balancing out bringing in the voices of Africa, bringing in the voices of women. But please, please, in that, let's not drown out men and empower men to step into their higher way of living and being too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I would add to that that um, so being an SGI member, there's or there's divisions, women's division, men's division, young women's, young men's, there's more, but it really helps to kind of grow up with this. Uh, if you grow in, if you grow up with it, I was in it for 11 years now. So I was part of the young men's, then the men's, but is a fostering that goes on. And the, the men's division are, they're part of what they're, where they're taught or they're spoken to is that it's their role to foster the young men and to teach them how to be men. And it's not like you don't go over and above to nothing crazy, but you just should serve an example. You check in on them, whether they ever call you back or not. Men are encouraged to call the young men to see how they're doing, make themselves available to talk, to, you know, sometimes do life experiences together, whatever it might be, and chant together. And it's been very valuable to me because I grew up without a father. And then I had these right. male figures finally who seemed at, at the very least respectable. If they were not my role model, that that's fine. But I could trust that at least their heart, they were trying to better themselves as people. And they were, you know, taking on responsibilities to make, to support women, to support young people. That's what there was. So in the SGI, we're taught that the men's role is to be a pillar. So when a man stands strong as a pillar, he's like the guy who, who holds a tent up. So the women and, and, and the young women and the young men can come and gather, but he has to hold the tent up. And when he's there standing firm, holding up the tent, everyone feels comfortable, especially when he, he does it with, you know, like confidence. Right. He at peace. But when the, the man's not there, this man is supposed to be strong. There's some element of that. When the man's not standing up and he looks defeated and, and you know, uh, no will to live, everyone else loses heart. So it's no, it's no use for that. Yeah. And okay. of course, women are trained in, in a certain way too, like to be the son of, uh, yeah. to, to give life force in a way. Yeah. So, yeah, so very um, profound. <laughs> all right. So what are your plans in the upcoming several months? Yeah. Just keep building this ship. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, I just took on a new imprint uh, for the for the publishing company. So I have Sacred Dragon in, uh, Publishing, which is my primary imprint, and that's an imprint primarily for um, nonfiction, so spiritual works and this kind of thing. So now I've, I've just recently partnered 
uh, with someone and we have a, a, a bringing in a new imprint called Creative, um, Creative Guild Press. And this will be non uh, will be fiction and primarily books. Uh, I'm looking at compilations, so multi author books on a particular theme. Also looking for unique books. One of the books I'm working on right now under that imprint is a, a book of poetry that's just unbelievable. But it's a combination of prose, poetry, quotes. And it'll be uh, very beautiful too. There'll be art in it. So um, I'm really, really excited to be expanding into fiction as well. I'm a fiction writer myself. And so, um, yeah, so I see, I see uh, that developing. I also am um, very uh, uh, yeah, hopeful that as we grow, uh, we create a writer's community because that's my real passion and love uh, is to create a writer's community where um, we're, working together, um, maybe on some of these compilation pieces, um, you know, we're meeting uh, and maybe even spending time writing together, sharing our work. Um, so, you know, that that's ultimately uh, what I see for Sacred Dragon Publishing is we've got fiction, nonfiction, and then we've got a, a writer's community. The other piece that I'm expanding into uh, fairly shortly is audible books. And, uh, that's a whole new a whole new era but it, it's just it it's how people engage with books uh, more and more so um my first uh, audi audible book will be coming out from suzanne suzanne ross um will be rise up and uh we're in the process of getting the production of that all worked out and uh but yeah so so those that's kind of the expanded view for me personally um, I think really, I'm just really happy uh, bringing this, this gift in right now. So that, that's really my focus for the next few months. But um, eventually, I look forward to some, you know, some fun and travel too. And I was telling John, I just went out to the golf course for the first time in a while today. So that was like super fun. But uh, yeah, that's kind of that's how things look for the next few months. Awesome. Awesome. So you clearly have a vision and you're taking things one step at a time and you're accomplishing a great, great deal um, in, in your healthy pace. Yeah, exactly. Um, so where can people find you to learn more about what you're doing? And if someone is interested in what you're doing and they want to know, maybe if you can work with them, uh, you know, let them, let us know how, how can they find you and what is your availability? And yeah, my, my, I would, you know, I, I think the best way would be to just, Go to the website and just kind of get a sense for who, who what we are. And, and you know, if you've listened, you kind of got a little bit of an idea about me. But my my main way that I like to connect is just talking to you and connecting with you. So, um, you know, as John will, as John knows, uh, I you know like to do Zoom like we're doing now. So I um, would encourage you to maybe pop on the website, um, schedule a free consultation. You can do it right there on the website. Or if that's, um, or you can just give me a buzz. My phone number's right there and um, just give me a call and we'll set up and we'll just talk. And uh, what I like to do is I like to talk to you quite a bit before we actually come to any kind of a, an arrangement about how we might work together. Because like I was saying, for me, it's about the person working with you, getting to know you, finding our rhythm, seeing what's gonna work, and then the business transaction or how, how, we're, how that's going to look for us is the result. So um, that's, you know, it, it's for me, it's just, let's talk, see where this goes. Yeah. And I would just add as someone who's been through that process with you, also as someone who's a teacher uh, and knowing, having worked with students who may not have been a good fit and having worked with students who are a good fit, uh, that process of someone being willing to take the time to, to talk it out for the mutual benefit. Again, it's like, are we a good match? If so, this is great. And it's good that we both know it. And if, if not, it's better not to enter into business transactions, yes. you know, yeah. ahead of time, because it, it, it's just, then, then you have to work your way out of it. Right. So um, the, this style is very, uh, I highly um, appreciate it and, and recommend that anyone who's interested I acknowledge that this is a great way to get to know someone is to discuss and to see if ideas match and, you know, no harm. Yeah, and sometimes like I have one client that I just worked with for a couple of months 
he had a book idea mm -hmm. and um we just chatted for a couple of months and helped him develop his book idea and then maybe he'll you know idea will come back in a few months and and connect up again but you know so, so it can be whatever it needs to be and i've got another client who right now we're just spending a lot of time talking and to see where it goes so yeah mm -hmm. and and um yeah so so thank you very much john that that's that's key to how to exactly how i like to operate is um let's get to know each other if there's something that works for us fantastic if not maybe we can just continue talking and enjoy the conversation because i love meeting people <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah oh, it, it's so nice it's so nice to be in a community where people want to actually help each other and we want to do it in a healthy way you know like I think one thing that you and I share in common and, and anyone who's listening to this most likely is that not only do we want to help each other, that mutual beneficial exchange, but we want to help each other, help each help others, right? We want right. to empower each other to be able to help more people. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of these, on, you know? Yeah. I mean, like a lot of the, the work that, that I'm doing right now is for people uh, kind of like, like in their passion or their business. So they're bringing all that wisdom into a book or a workbook that that's allowing them to share it on a much bigger scale, kind of like, you know, somewhat what we're doing with you too is, you know, creating a, a message that 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 can get out to more people. And then, you know, as my business grows and as we get more marketing around, you know, we have better ways of, of getting that information out there. But absolutely, it's it's about working together so that we can help others and, and you know, get that message out there. Mm -hmm. And this is very, I think what we're doing is very grassroots. And I just say that because, uh, because that's what it seems like. And I think that that's the, those are the only things in life that really, really end up with longevity and long lasting is truly grassroots or organizations or, or communities or movements, you know? Exactly. That's why, that's why ultimately I have such a passion for creating a community of writers that you know, we just in, enjoy creating together and inspiring each other to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that note, All right. that we'll <laughs> let each other rest. <laughs> yeah, it's late for you. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm still in yeah. I don't know what time it is, but yeah, I know. No, I know. I know. We're in different timelines here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to get these this uh, this up onto YouTube soon and I'll get send you the links. Um, so everyone who's wa who's watched and if you've stayed with us this long, you must be a soul family. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> you know, and uh, for yeah, anybody who's watched a little bit or whatever, um, we appreciate you hanging out with us. And uh, please go check out sacreddragonpublishing.com, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And uh, so until till next time, Andy. Have All a, right. Thanks so much, John. It yep. was great being here. Thanks, everyone. Uh, look forward night. to meeting you. All yeah. Right. And go, go <laughs> hang out with Andy sometime soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Right, take care.